hand comes down. It should be like 30 minutes later. So we have court reporters. I'd like to call the November meeting of the Cape Elizabeth School Board to order at this time. Uh, our chairman, Mr. Patius, will be joining us a little bit later, but we do need to get started at this time. Uh, let's begin with a superintendent's report. Dr. Pelletier. Madam Chairperson, uh, there's been a request uh, that we move uh, an item uh, to the front of the agenda so that uh, people in attendance can go to another meeting. And I would suggest uh, that the agenda special item, item three, uh, be taken before the superintendent's report. All right, thank you. Uh, item three concerns a, an, approve, uh, an approval of an amended administrative guideline, which was discussed last, uh, at, at our last meeting. Uh, the, the new administrative guideline reads as follows. Our school department has a long and positive history of respecting family needs within educational programming. This directive officially requests that no major examinations or school-sponsored co-curricular activities be conducted during the school day and that the, in the introduction of new coursework be minimized on dates when students of various faiths are, absence, are absent in observance of holy days. Examples of these days are Jewish New Year, Day of Atonement, and Good Friday. Now this is an, a guideline that has been in effect for several years. There has been one part which has been added to this guideline, and that part was uh, the item, the introduction of new coursework be minimized. We discussed at our last meeting the possibility of, of uh, well, we did discuss the idea of having no new work introduced, which correlates with the Portland uh, guideline for religious holidays. And uh, at that time, a committee uh, was named, which met during this year, uh, during this month, with Mr. Holt, myself, and uh, some members of the community. And at that time, in our discussion, we decided that really that should be the prerogative of the teacher whether new work would be introduced and if it were, were needed it could be introduced but that what we were hoping for was an awareness by the teacher that there are re religious holidays that do take the students away and that we support that policy and um, that when possible new work not be introduced but that it not be a mandate by the school board that they, that they not introduce the new work. Uh, we, we were very cautious in being sure that this would not be considered by the students or particularly by the teachers as an in-school holiday. Uh, Mr. Holder, is there anything that you might want to add to that? No, I think that uh, uh, this was really a result of uh, somewhat new staff and new uh, high school and new middle school principals this year and some new people. And there were some things scheduled last year and early this year that uh, probably shouldn't have been scheduled on some holidays. For example, I know in the Pond Cove Elementary School there were school pictures scheduled and there were children that were out because of the religious holidays. And I think that there's been an attempt now to clarify that position and we'll next year uh, and ongoing this year we'll, we'll make every effort and ask the administration to make every effort to ensure that uh, these situations be avoided so that uh, we don't have uh, uh, problems. And I think that this policy, as we've outlined it tonight, or as Loretta has read it, I think does that. Uh, is there anyone in the audience that would like to comment on this policy, the, uh, the changes in the policy? No, I'd like to make a, uh, a comment. Uh, I understood uh, from just a, a casual conversation I had uh, earlier today that there would be some public comment here. And I wonder if the people uh, knew that we were going to accelerate it and put it uh, first on the agenda. Yes, they did. And that's why it has been put early on the agenda, oh. so that they, if anyone wanted to comment, that they would be in attendance to do so. And, and those people that you have spoken to are in agreement with that uh, policy? Yes, it was the consensus of the group, uh, the group that met, a group of five. Any comments? Well, then. Just I just add, yes. Madam Chairperson, that the the Administrative Council has discussed this. The Anti-Defamation League uh, sent me uh, several uh, what they call notebooks, which is an excellent calendar explaining all of this. And uh, 
in September of next year, it'll be on our agenda again very early. So hopefully we'll be able to help the staff understand what this is all about early in the year. All right, do I hear a motion that we accept this administrative guideline as amended? So moved. Second. That was easy. There's only two. <laughs> all right, it's been moved and seconded. Um, no further discussion. All in favor? Okay, all opposed. Thank you. All right. Excuse yes. Me, and would you identify yourself, please? I'm Lisa Cohen, a parent in the Cape School System and Vice President of the Jewish Federation of Southern Maine. And um, on behalf of the parents, the children who were affected this year, we understand that when there's a lot of staff changes, sometimes rules and guidelines get put aside. We thank you for your sensitivity and understanding and the way you handled the situation. We will look forward to working with you again next year to make sure it doesn't happen. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our next order of business will be the superintendent's report. Dr. Pelletier, may I turn this over Thank you. you. Are the uh, representatives from the high school here with any agenda? Good. Would you identify yourself, please? My name is Peter Glasser, and I'm <laughs> one of the school board representatives. The other one, Brian Wagstaff, is acting in the school 1X tonight, so he won't be with us. Um, first of all, the sports season, fall sports seasons, came to an end this Saturday. Um, the girls' soccer team won the state championship by beating Caribou three to nothing, and the boys' champion uh, team also won the championship. But there has been a little bit of controversy in that. With about nine minutes to go in the game, a Morse player was awarded a penalty kick. Now he made the kick to tie the score at one to one at that point, but one of the other Morse players was caught inside the goalie box, which he's not allowed to be in during a penalty kick. So the referee called the kick back. Um, however, according to the state rules at that time, there was supposed to be another kick awarded uh, to replace the other kick, which was not. So Morse High has filed a protest with the school, uh, with the state rather. And there's about a 50-50 chance that now we will replay the game, um, giving Cape a one to nothing lead and starting from the point of the second penalty kick, which should have been awarded. Um, a week ago Saturday in Augusta, the state championships were uh, in cross country, and our boys' cross country team also won that state championship. And the girls' field hockey team came within one game of going to the state finals. They lost in the Western Maine finals, however, one to nothing. And now the winter sports season is underway. Um, last Monday, the boys and girls basketball teams and boys and girls swim teams started their practices. Um, tonight, there's also some activities going on at the school. Uh, tonight and tomorrow night, the one acts will be performed, which I mentioned before Brian is in now. Um, this is uh, each class of the four classes at the high school will choose, direct, and act a play all on their own, a one act play. and that is like a festival and they'll award prizes for the actors and the best play and so on. Um, also, on a final note, this week on Thursday and Friday the school held elections, or mock elections for the students who are not yet 18 and would not otherwise have a chance to vote. And this was put on Thursday and Friday and the winners of that um, were George Bush who won 148 to 94 and the other winners were uh, Mr. Brennan, Mr. Mitchell, uh, Mary Webster, and Barbara Gill all won their categories. <laughs> Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, I think our high school was right on target with the nation, it looked like. Uh, would it be appropriate for uh, us to draft letters of congratulations to the different sporting groups and Certainly. their successful season and the coaches? Certainly. Fine. I think that's, they're very well deserved. When are we supposed to hear on the appeal on the side? I, I was just told that it was on television. Our AD is here, and he knows up to the minute, I'm sure. Mr. Weatherby, uh, can you tell us uh, whether the decision's been made? Uh, 
It's been a long day. Um, I just got back a little while ago from Augusta, and uh, the game is going to be replayed from the point where the mistake was made by the officials with nine minutes and 30 seconds left. Uh, hopefully on Saturday at 11 o'clock, uh, we're hoping at Falmouth High School. If the game is tied at the end of that, then they'll go into sudden death, four sudden death overtime periods, and finish it as if it was a regular game. So the protest was uh, upheld by the uh, State Principals Association. May I ask a question? What if the Morse player misses the kick? Then they keep on playing. That's the, the mistake was made with nine minutes and 30 seconds ago, and so they just will start from that point, and whatever happens, if he misses the kick, then the play continues. If nothing happens, the remaining nine minutes and 30 seconds, then the game's over. Just as if it was a regular game and nothing had happened before then. May I ask a question? Yes. No, because I've been getting these. The game of, it ends at the one to one. And they go into an overtime, 10 minute overtime. Right. It's still one to one. They do an additional overtime. What happens if it's still one to one in the second overtime? They play four of them. Four of them. Yeah. What happens after the fourth if it's. Uh, if it's still tied one to one, then there are co champions. That, that's kind of unique, uh, I guess. Uh, that's, you might say so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we might make the Guinness Book of World Records on this one. Thank you. How many, uh, I just have one question. How much controversy was there over that uh, ruling by the protest committee? Um, kind of difficult to answer your question. Controversy, obviously there was a lot of controversy on our part, a lot of controversy on Morse's part. Um, but those who voted, finally. Uh, there was unanimous vote on their part. There are a lot of things that are involved here. I mean, I don't know if you want to take the time to get into it, but the State Principal Association has, uh, I think, has created a lot of problems for themselves because supposedly there are no protests. And now it's obvious that there are protests. And uh, I found out at the meeting there today that this actually is the fourth protest that they have heard in the past three years. And so even though they supposedly do not have any protest procedure, they obviously do have a protest procedure. And uh, I don't know what else to say. Well, I, I sympathize with everybody involved, but I've played sports and watched sports for many, many years. I never heard, I can't, can't think of a single case where a, uh, a referee's error, which is, after all. Is what it was. It happens. It yeah. does happen. Uh, that's uh, the luck of the draw. Uh, but replaying the game, I mean, that's. Seems quite unusual. Well, this ruling me. was made uh, from the uh, national organization in Kansas City. Made that decision that that's the way it should be done if the committee upheld the protest. Hmm. Fascinating. <laughs> good luck. There will be a fascinating study of human nature if we see what happens. <laughs> well, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Weatherford. Uh, the second item, I'd like to just comment briefly on the. Uh, main school management conference that I attended in um, Augusta. Uh, the two things that uh, I want to share with you, and I've uh, put it in the backup, is the uh, teacher performance uh, process and issues uh, that uh, I thought was uh, very adequate but uh, not as progressive or as sophisticated as our evaluation system. And uh, I was very pleased to see that uh, those people moving into a very sophisticated uh, evaluation system for teachers are pretty much paralleling the kind of system that we've uh, adopted here for the last three years. Uh, ours is a little more sophisticated, but uh, ours, of course, attaches uh, remuneration. Uh, theirs do not. Most of the state, uh, most of the school systems in this state do not. Uh, then uh, I was very interested in the school board superintendent relations package that was put on by the Agunquit superintendent and the board. The entire board was there. They've done a lot of work in this area, and I'm not sure why, whether it was needed or what. But I thought at least I'd share it with you. You note they have policies around uh, uh, communication, and I was very much impressed with what they were doing. And then I was very much impressed with the gifted program in the Fort Kent regional area 
that's been going for six years, from the fourth grade to the eleventh grade. Uh, I've written for all of their material, and I'll share that with the board when I receive it. One of the uh, aspects of that that I thought were very interesting is the teachers, or some of the teachers, were from the university in Fort Kent. And it was interesting to see a chemistry prof working with fourth and fifth grade kids on diets and uh, with animals and uh, uh, feeding them uh, pizza and coke or uh, type A lunches and having the animals right at the cafeteria to watch one disintegrate and the other, you know, <laughs> jump off through hoops. Uh, some of the topics I was extremely impressed with. So uh, I, it was, all in all, it was a worthwhile conference. Uh, the update on the uh, use of our extra half hour per day, I'd like to ask the principals. Uh, one of the things I've been able to do is uh, uh, your reports have been passed along to the board. So they've read the entire report. What I'd like the principals to do is merely highlight very briefly uh, the way you're using your half hour. And this is primarily for the public because these are lengthy reports that have gone to the board. The board has them. So uh, could we start with Barbara Powers, our Pawn Cove School principal? to talk about our use of extra time in a couple of ways, both in terms of the children and how it translates in the classroom, as well as our new use of having some early release time in the afternoons, because I'm sure it's of interest to you of how we're choosing to use that time as well. Um, in talking with the teachers, uh, it became clear that, again, when you're, when you're dealing with uh, all uh, homeroom classes as we are, extra time, it's, it's, it's sort of like air expanding to meet its parameters. Um, we are finding that it's giving us some flexibility within our whole language programming, children having access to materials, um, some uh, ability to pull out charts and materials uh, that, they, that they might have more restricted access to. Um, there is some um, silent reading that has been inserted at grade levels where it hadn't been before. Uh, also, it's hard to describe in terms of a daily use because we're talking about half an hour every single day, but we are having uh, heightened expectations in the delivery of science curriculum. So even though that might be something that would take up um, an hour during a week, having the extra time daily does allow a little less um, frantic planning when it comes to trying to cover everything that we're asking our teachers to cover. So the addition of curricular expectations and the transition in our whole language program, um, both have uh, been accommodated by this extra time. It amounts to actually about three hours every two weeks, as you know. During our release afternoons, we've been pretty much um, scheduling high interest kinds of programs for the entire staff. That's not going to maintain throughout the entire school year. There will be times when we're doing strictly grade level planning there is an enormous interest in our school in having more access to plain old planning time because of the uh, transition in language curriculum, uh, the, the new work we're doing in science and math. People are feeling fairly needy in terms of being able to sit down together and talk through curricular process and change. Uh, but so far what we have done is, um, is a real nice piece we do at the start of the year where teachers can simply have the time to catch up with the previous year sending teachers and talk about children in, a, in an environment that's not catch as catch can in the hallway. It's, it's scheduled, teachers are to be in their classroom certain times of the, of the afternoon and we all sort of rotate around and visit with people and take some notes and compare notes about kids. This is about three weeks into the year. Um, let's see, our second time um, was when Rachel McAnellen was in town and we were able to have a consultation with her with the K-1 teachers for an hour and then with the two, three teachers for an hour. Um, Grade level meetings are also occurring regularly during this release time. And uh, finally, Sue Welch, at our last early release afternoon, presented um, a lot of information about the summer curriculum work in language arts for the staff who had not been present. And it was really important that she have a focused audience for that particular presentation. Um, next week, we're going to be doing some processing around setting priorities for ourselves so that the the anxiety level in the building can be dealt with a little bit in terms of the amount of work we're asking people to cope with this year. 
Um, in December, we have a joint time with the middle school planned and our language arts uh, coordinator and two other teachers are going to be going to the middle school to present an update to middle school staff about our work in language arts. Uh, as you notice in here, I don't know how much you'd like me to go into this in terms of, of details because it's pretty much as I share with you. Um, there's continuing concern about fatigue issues. Um, teachers have voiced it from the beginning, both in terms of children as well as uh, their own in, in helping the children deal with theirs and the reduced planning time at the beginning and ending of, of the day for them. I have heard directly from probably three parents, and you've seen copies of letters that I've seen. I've heard directly from one parent saying I'm representing a lot of parents who are supportive of this. Five parents isn't enough for me to begin to tell you how our parent body in general feels about the extended time. Um, I didn't hear a lot of feedback uh, on that issue from conferences, and I would encourage us at some point to really take a look closely at our full 500 parent population and see what consensus is in the regard regarding fatigue because I simply can't represent that to you accurately. It sounds like you've heard from less than 2% of the parents. Yes, directly. Mm -hmm. I've heard from about 1% of the parents. <laughs> okay. And I've heard from 1%, so that makes two. <laughs> Maybe the same, same parents. <laughs> uh, none of this came up at, at uh, parent-teacher conferences? I mean, you didn't, this wasn't? It hasn't been, I, I haven't, John, honestly been able to talk with a lot of teachers. We, we had a language arts committee meeting after school today and we were talking a bit about some materials we shared with parents around whole language and parents' response to their children participating in the pilot, but, but that wasn't an issue that has come up. But I haven't asked the question directly either. Is there some way that uh, we can research this further without we c I, I send out a monthly newsletter. Our Parents Association sends out a monthly newsletter. Certainly, if you'd like feedback at some point in the game, I know that you are scheduled to meet with both middle school and elementary school parents in some evening programming in November and January. That may be your opportunity also to ask the question. But I'd be happy to do whatever um, preliminary work that might be required for that. We've also had an opportunity to, uh, for at least a few days, to see uh, daylight saving time. And that'll make some kind of difference, so that it'll give us a, a better picture. It gets darker at this point, and that's a real concern because it cuts into the playtime for a lot of our youngsters. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I suspect we'll probably be hearing more. More. Yeah. Uh, also, I, I would like to see a survey because I think uh, I've had a, a couple, three letters, but uh, it isn't always it isn't all fatigue. We're cutting into some playtime for youngsters, mm -hmm. and that disturbs a number of people. There's also, as I noted in here, our children are very, very scheduled and busy, and there are some unflexible programs for children that they, that they are literally bounding out the door as we begin dismissal at about 3.08 to jump in cars and go to Portland. Um, there hasn't been any kind of subsequent cutback in, in children's scheduled activities that I can see, so they really are being stretched that extra 30 minutes, certainly. Okay. Thank you, Barbara. <coughs> I'll be very happy to fill in for Chris Toy, who was unable to be with us. As we know, this has been changed. Uh, grade four has used the additional time to provide foreign language, the additional classroom instruction and recess time that uh, we had planned a year or so ago. Grade five has integrated <coughs> chorus, band, instrumental instruction, sustained silent reading, tutorial time, both special needs and regular cl classroom, math skills, and additional classroom instruction. In grade six, they've incorporated band, chorus, silent reading, guided study, and special <coughs> topics. Uh, now, as we all know, the band and chorus problem a year or so ago uh, uh, was a problem we'd been trying to alleviate. Grade seven has used the additional time to integrate the visiting artist program and to provide for some common planning time for teachers within the school day. As you know, we've moved that integrated arts into uh, higher levels of the middle school. Grade eight has used the time to provide an additional period, creating a nine period day. This has allowed more flexibility for the students to choose courses, pick up additional electives, or needed uh, guided study. The uh, high school Mr. Miles is here, and uh, he has written a very lengthy report. They're taking a hard look on the high school level. Mr. Miles, would you like to sort of give us a synopsis of uh, your additional time?
We uh, basically looked at, at two options of using this time. One was simply to uh, divide the time up among the existing seven periods during the day, putting roughly four minutes on each, each period, and probably adding the other two minutes to, to each of the lunch waves, and uh, thereby increasing each period's length from 42 minutes to 46 minutes. But we didn't feel that that solution would solve some of our schedule problems which we faced, um, mainly in the form of laboratory uh, science conflicts with non-science uh, courses. Um, so what we looked at uh, in July when we really had to solve this problem after the high school schedule had been built and all the students had selected courses and so on uh, was a way to somehow alleviate lab conflicts without rebuilding the schedule. And our way of doing that was to create an extended period, really a 70-minute period instead of a 42-minute period. Um, and what we, what we did do is see if we, if we created one period during the day that was longer than all the others and, and continued with the rotating schedule, which the high school has had for several years, could we rotate the periods in which we'd scheduled laboratory sciences through that 70-minute block um, so that over the course of the week, every science class which had a lab would also have a 70-minute period in which to hold that lab. And we were able to do that. The result has been that on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, um, the 70-minute period uh, is between the, the, the two lunch waves. And on Tuesday and Thursday, it precedes um, the lunch periods. And that has, I think, begun to work out very well. Uh, when I had written this r report to you, I had not gotten back all of the responses of a survey that I asked the faculty to fill out. And I think it's, it's fair to say that um, about 70 percent of the faculty are in, are in favor of the 70-minute period and I think are using the, the period um, well. I think they're, much, they're using it much better than um, I think a number of students and, and teachers and even I had at first uh, felt. I think it's, it's fair to say that uh, maybe 30 percent of the faculty have some reservations. Some are simply not in favor of it, and some are, are not in favor of the way we have implemented the 70-minute period. They wish we, in fact, could have a 70-minute period for all seven periods, not for just five. And so I, it, there's a sort of a mixture of the reservations, but I think that su the substantial majority of the faculty um, support it and are using it well. And I, as they have used it now for a quarter, many of them are discovering more ways to, to use the period effectively. At the same time that I think most of the faculty are in favor of it, um, from what I have heard in, in talking with students in different classes, and, and I've met really, I think, with almost every, every class, 9 through 12, in, in different uh, subject areas, um, the students, um, I would say a half of them, maybe two-thirds of them, are not in favor of the extended period. Um, One-third of them are very much in favor of it. So I think it depends on who you talk to. Um, whether th th this is uh, um, a good thing or a bad thing. For us, it's a temporary thing in any case. Uh, we're, we're, first of all, looking at some ways to perhaps improve and fine-tune the use of this period for this year. Uh, it may be that making some adjustments in, in, in when we schedule that period, whether it's before lunch or after lunch, whether it's interrupted by bells or not, makes a difference in how students and teachers view the period. Um, so currently, uh, the faculty is considering a couple of alternatives, and I think by the end of this month, we will make a decision as to how, if, how we'll fine-tune it if we're going to touch it at all. But more importantly, I think the addition of that 30 minutes uh, makes it incumbent on us to re-examine the entire high school schedule before we schedule a school for next year to see, in fact, what kind of adjustments for the long term we want to make. Um, do we, do we want to have this extended period? Uh, do we want to rotate it through seven days? Do we want to add an extra period to the day? Not increase the time, the length of time, but just simply have eight 42-minute periods. Um, do we want to uh, adjust the passing time? There are a lot of options and variables, and we are going to uh, have a committee of teachers and students who will look at a number of options, look at other high school schedules, um, look at our instructional program and see if we can't create um, before we schedule a school in March, a better 
if you will, time frame for us to, to uh, have governing instruction. And I think that's um, where we are at the moment. Um, I think this year we will make what we are using now work as best we can, um, but we will make a, a, a considered a decision next March, uh, having had the time to do the planning that we, that we need. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll, uh, that's the end of the superintendent's report. Uh, I'll uh, pass it back to the chairman for item D. Uh, our next report will be on a meeting held between the town council and the school board, which was held on October 24th, and we wanted to give you an update of, of that meeting. Um, several issues were discussed at that meeting. Uh, the first was uh, a concern of, of the town council as well as the school board, and that was the, the issue of substance abuse. And we began to talk about the problem in Cape Elizabeth, and we talked for nearly two hours. And, and had we addressed all six of our uh, agenda items in the same time frame that we addressed the first one, substance abuse, we would have been there until the wee hours of the morning. Um, we came to no conclusions, but there was a genuine concern between the town and the school working together to try to alleviate this problem. Uh, some of the positive aspects are that Wayne Creelman from the town council and I both serve on the community team, uh, along with many citizens of the community, representatives from the town government, uh, the police force, clergy, uh, and then representatives from the different neighborhoods. And there are many, many programs being addressed by that group, some of which include a program called Safe Homes, where parents commit to homes that are safe and free from alcohol, and that when young people are in their homes, that uh, alcohol would never be served in their homes. Another program called Parent Peer Groups, where parents of young people who are friends gather together, the parents gather, and decide on curfews, uh, family policies that they are in agreement with, with their children's friends, and so they come out as a unit in the fact that uh, they have similar standards. And uh, the community involvement in Project Graduation, which since last year has become an all-night party, and is always well supported by the community as well as the schools. Um, Police Chief Pickering had much to say and I believe that probably if, if there was a consensus it was that the school, that the community, and that the individual homes needed to work together closely, uh, particularly with our younger students, uh, our younger children, uh, addressing the problems to them early so that they'll make decisions early that they will not be drinkers, they will not abuse uh, drugs, and that this will come about through a very strong health curriculum in the schools, which is being addressed through our curriculum coordinator and through the, the different buildings. Um, a second issue that was discussed was uh, the condition of the athletic fields. Bob Malley talked to the group and told us the conditions and the work being done on the different athletic fields. Um, there will be fields that will be vacant next fall and some in the spring, and so there will be a, um, a staggering usage of the fields so that they will time best and be in, in top-notch condition for the different athletic events. Uh, an update was given to the town council by the schools on the status of our facility needs. Uh, the school administrative council is discussing each month different possibilities of ways to maximize our present space uh, with a preference for not building, not spending money on uh, a building project, but trying to utilize the space that we have, if at all possible. And uh, different ideas and possibilities are being discussed and will be probably presented to the school board in February, I believe was the, the time given to us. Um, we addressed a surplus in the community services department, a, a, a surplus of $40,000 which will remain in the Board of Education budget. 
um, there was some discussion of where this money should be placed and it was decided that it would remain in the Board of Education budget. There were a few other agenda items, but those are the ones that come to mind as being the, the most significant. Any that you'd like to add? No, I think that's... Uh, it was a very good meeting and I, I think we meet with the town council uh, twice a year and it's a very, very good time to share ideas and common concerns. Uh, our next item is a report on uh, the negotiating committee, which is meeting with the teachers, the school board negotiating committee, and uh, Peter Leslie will give us an update on that committee. The, uh, the committee, which is composed of uh, Loretta Pond, myself, uh, the school board's outside council, and uh, Mr. LaBelle, the business manager, met with the teachers uh, to receive their contract proposal for the next two uh, school years. Uh, we went through with them. Uh, they explained uh, it was quite clearly presented, uh, but we went over the points verbally. Uh, since then, we have been analyzing uh, the proposal of the association, and we have had uh, one lengthy meeting and we've been doing some work uh, at home uh, and talking to each other. There's nothing much more than that to report because uh, our analysis is ongoing. I think we have a meeting scheduled, I don't have my calendar, but I think it's within 10 days to um, discuss the uh, association's proposal. So that's uh, the report as of this moment. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Pelletier, would you like to tell us about our report card that we have recently gotten from our state? This is uh, something new in the state's report card put out by the State Department of Education. Uh, basically, it's a series of facts that we send to the state. They, in turn, compile it in some kind of a booklet form. And uh, I might add that it's not as sophisticated as the kind of reports that we have been giving the board and the community. However, uh, we have to think in terms of the state, and probably for some people it was a first. It gives uh, citizenry an opportunity. And the reason why I bring it to the board's attention, it's uh, been very controversial if you look at the number of papers around, because unfortunately, uh, the explanations that were pressed weren't adequate, and people have been comparing secondary education costs to uh, elementary education costs. I'll give you an example. Uh, that isn't fun. Uh, they published uh, the administrative cost of a unit in this state where there was one administrator, a superintendent, and his salary was 167000 Now, of course, that was a mistake. <laughs> and uh, it uh, drew much controversy. And that was discussed this morning in Augusta. So unfortunately, it's had received bad press, but I would hope uh, they'll probably build on that. And uh, hopefully someday it'll be as sophisticated as our publication that we put out last year, which deals with the, where our kids go, our aspirational levels, and a host of things. But it's a beginning, and uh, it's available to anybody who wants to see it. And I would uh, make very certain it's in our own libraries, and we'll send one to the public library, or two, or three, so that citizens want to see that. Uh, those are facts that are very public. That's all I have to say. Was there anything in it that was particularly uh, surprising or seemed to surprise you about our Not system a bit. in comparison? Not a bit. So it was things that you already knew. Thank you. Uh, a report on the handicap accessibility. All right. I'd like to uh, report on that because, uh, as we know, uh, uh, last year we started uh, to. Uh, put our schools in shape for handicap accessibility. Uh, and while we've done pretty well on the elementary level and a section of the middle school, uh, there's still very much to do. And at the present time, I've worked uh, carefully with the coordinator of the 504, it's what it's called, uh, the coordinator of uh, the 504 project from the State Department is coming to us in December 13th, 14th, and 15th 
to do an analysis of the complete middle school, but more importantly, the old section. Uh, we have to have that school, or we should have it, handicap accessible presently, and we do not have that section. There are 11 elevations. Uh, I've asked uh, the architect to uh, give some thought to what he might do. The gentleman's called Mr. Trask, and I'll have the architect meet Mr. Trask uh, while they're inspecting the building, and then the report will come to us early in January. And I think that I'm going to suggest to the board, if the cost is extravagant, and by that I mean uh, 100000 or more, and I suspect it's going to be, because, you know, we spent almost $80,000 on the elementary school, <coughs> half of which was federal funded, but now those funds uh, are no longer in existence. We, um, next year, will not be paying any debt on the high school and boilers that were, were purchased, I think, three or four years ago with borrowed money. And uh, I think what I'd like to do is when I see the extent of the package, is put it together and come to the board and uh, show you the differences in how we paid the boiler in the high school. And probably this would be a wise way to go in terms of making that middle school handicap accessible. And once we do that, that'll be the end of it because our high school, as you all know, has an elevator. And our high school is in pretty good shape. So uh, this, I think, uh, frankly, is long overdue. And uh, the reason why I'm bringing it to your attention at this point is we know by, from experience it takes a certain amount of time to get this all done. And uh, we know that in two years we'll have one or more youngsters in wheelchairs going into the middle school. But that should be, now for example, we have a youngster that cannot eat in our cafeteria because there's no way for that child to get them. Where does that person eat now? Where, do that, where does that person have their, his or her lunch? In the room, in a room close by. That's, uh, and that's been acceptable to the parents, but sure. at the same time, that isn't correct. This, this is, is in the middle school? school? Yes. So, uh, we're on top of that, and we'll have a full report to you just as soon as the coordinator finishes his report, and then the architect gets on it. Uh, I, I don't want to uh, play architect, but uh, I've been there several times with other people, and there's a possibility we may have to do an elevator in that school. And I don't have to tell you that those are expensive. And probably an exterior elevator. Right. Sort of Hyatt style, I guess. Glass overlooking, Glass. overlooking <laughs> field. <laughs> Last week, we had a very pleasant afternoon, which was one of the nice parts of being on the school board. The, the, uh, the school committee and the administrative group at the high, at the uh, of the school system uh, had a tea for all the volunteers who uh, spent so much time in, in making the, the middle school playground a reality. Uh, we had it in the late afternoon and teachers and administrators and, and all the, the uh, for, well, a few men, but m mostly a lot of mothers who worked very, very hard to arrange uh, the playground and the money raising and then brought their husbands out on Saturday morning and, and uh, I think it was probably the event of the year in Cape Elizabeth and if you have not gone by to see the playground, uh, try to go during daylight hours so you can see how much pleasure it's giving a, an awfully lot of children. Uh, and that was a pleasure to recognize those people for their efforts. Dr. Pelletier, I believe there's an announcement of a resignation. Yes. Uh I would suggest that uh, you accept the resignation of Geraldine Owens, special education teacher. Uh, you have a letter to the effect that she will be resigning as of January the 20th. Thank you. Do I hear a motion that we accept Ms. Owens' resignation? So moved. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Yes, uh, under J, uh, the, my recommendation for a Fulbright teacher exchange program. 
Uh, I'm recommending that uh, teacher David Perry, who is on leave of absence, be listed as a teacher on our staff in the language department. Mr. Perry was a French teacher, a very excellent teacher, uh, who left us because of some personal uh, c conditions in his family and uh, would like to return to this school system uh, after his Fulbright. And the conditions of a Fulbright are an exchange of teacher for teacher. We carried the teacher, the, uh, the system in Europe, and in this case it would probably be Senegal or France, uh, would carry the teacher. Uh, housing is uh, provided by the individual teachers, however we would have to help to find them. And I think in this case it will be an exchange. They're discussing a possible exchange. So what it would mean to us is that Mr. Perry would return to us the following year on our staff, would be on our staff next year. We would receive a Fulbright teacher from X Place who would be a French teacher. Uh, there are two reasons why I'm recommending this. Number one is Mr. Perry is an excellent teacher and the kind of person that we would like to retain here for as long as we can. And secondly, uh, bringing a Fulbright and re having reviewed the kind of rigor that Fulbright people go through in terms of standards, uh, we're pretty much assured we get a very excellent person. Uh, equally as important from my point of view is that it would bring a certain amount of adult globalness to our school. And uh, I think we, we could use that. So uh, I'm recommending that uh, Mr. Perry uh, be placed on our staff next year as a Fulbright exchange teacher. Now, he is presently, I've just had three discussions with him, he is presently uh, going through the process and taking a chance that uh, we would accept him and the Fulbright will accept him. But he's highly qualified and I suspect that he will make it. But uh, he's going to have to tell them whether or not it's acceptable to this board uh, before they make a decision on him. So that's why I'm bringing it to you at this point in time. So what does it cost us? His salary, is that, I mean, we pay his salary? We pay his salary, but they pay the they teacher's pay salary. So we, we will be bringing a teacher on uh, without uh, any cost to us whatsoever. What about the housing? Is that out of? I think generally what they try to do is exchange houses, and Mr. Perry's house is still here, and I think that's what he plans to do, exchange family for family. That would not be, that would, that would not cost us anything. However, it would work out. When would we know this? This month. If uh, the board accepts him, uh, I'll notify him tomorrow. He'll notify the uh, Fulbright board, and uh, we should know as soon as they make that decision, and I suspect it'll be this month. Is he planning to come back if he's not accepted as he, a Fulbright scholar? I think so. We've discussed his coming back all along, and uh, this is an opportunity I think he'd like to take. Uh, as a Fulbright scholar, he has to come back. It's like our sabbatical. But uh, I suspect if something happened that it didn't work, uh, yes, I think he would come back because it's been his intention since he's left in our discussions that he wanted to come back here. Questions? I have no questions. <laughs> You're Sounds on. Like <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a good idea to what, me. What, what kind of uh, action? You do, you, do you need a vote or do you need the sense of the board on this? Uh, sense of the board is what I need so I can tell the Fulbright board that uh, we're in his corner. It's fine with me. I'd like to have Mr. Perry back, so that Absolutely. would be, that'd be whatever way. Yes. Yeah, you have a sense of the board. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you want me to go to K, the Greeley athletic incident? 
Yes. Right. Be before you uh, go to Kay, and I'm going to apologize for being uh, late tonight. Uh, have you had discussion about the uh, state championship soccer teams? Yes. Okay. The AD is here, and he filled us in. He just got back from Augusta, where the big decision was made. Oh, well, what was the decision? <laughs> uh, I agree with that, Mr. Weatherby. If I had been here, I would have known. However, I wasn't here, so I don't know, and that prompts my question. I just uh, wanted to say that uh, I thought that, that uh, our, uh, our team uh, would, uh, would see that as a real challenge, uh, to go back out there. It's the toughest thing in the world uh, to do after you've been told that you won a state championship and to be called back on the field a week later to go and, uh, and, and, and do that. But I think they know that the entire community uh, senses what they've been through and that everybody's pulling for them, and uh, they were the best team. There is no question about that, and uh, I'm sure they're going to be the best team on Saturday, too. Uh, so whatever happens on Saturday, they're still the cha state championships as champions as far as we're concerned. The girls' team uh, did an outstanding job. I was, uh, I was delighted to, to spend the day up there watching those two teams play, and I think everybody in the town, whether they like soccer or not, would be very proud of not only the performance of these kids, both boys and girls, in representing this town and their school, uh, but also the coaches who put in uh, so much time and effort in coaching these kids and going well beyond what one would expect a coach normally to have to do. I mean, they, these coaches are totally committed, and that's why they're state championship teams. And uh, finally, I told the athletic director that uh, we were going to count the sports in which he did not win state championships because that was easier to do than to, w to count the ones in which he, they, we did win state championships. I'm sorry to interject, but I didn't want the evening to go through with an, out, an opportunity to say those things. Which opportunity? I would have had earlier had I been here. <laughs> <laughs> I think you ought to tell Jan uh, because so she knows the results. Oh, the state uh, <laughs> championship thing? Why am I going to ask Keith to tell her? Well, if Jan had been here, she would have known. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, why, don't we, uh, why don't we go to the next item on your report, Mr. Board Superintendent, board. which is a report on uh, athletic incident in the Greeley Cape Elizabeth soccer game? Uh, unfortunately, uh, we've had uh, a few instances uh, where uh, our relationships with the Greeley athletic teams have not been uh, in our best interest. Uh, however, I want to say I'd like to congratulate the high school principal and the AD and the booster people for the manner in which they handled this very late incident. Uh, it's well reported in your November 3rd report from the high school principal. Uh, their high school principal has been here, spoken to our administrators, the Booster Club. I believe we have a board member that was part of that meeting. I was. The high school principal called me two days ago, the Greeley high school principal, and felt that uh, if he should come this evening to talk with the board, and I felt that at this point I, I saw no reason why he had to, uh, in as much as uh, our conditions are very well stated by our high school principal. And uh, it was my feeling uh, very early in the game that uh, we would not tolerate any kind of incident where uh, the young people are not sportsman-like. And uh, we do not have to play teams where incidents such as the one that happened, the fight, and a youngster being hurt on the field by something that was thrown. So uh, again, I think we have everybody's attention. Our conditions have been established, and uh, we're going to watch those very carefully. And I would hope that uh, we could play this team for the next 50 years. Uh, however, uh, we're going to, if these conditions uh, do not, or if they break these, if there's a breakdown in these conditions, uh, the superintendent's going to come to the board. And, uh, 
ask that uh, we no longer play. But uh, at this point in time, I feel the situation has been very well handled. And uh, <clears throat> I would like to see what might happen in another season. I, 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 I happen to be of the view that uh, that that these kinds of things uh, are cyclical. I don't think we're going to go through uh, 20 years of having uh, trouble with Greeley. The, the, the trouble is not with the school. The trouble is uh, between individuals or uh, and created by individuals. And I suspect that uh, if they're troublemakers, uh, they're going to move on uh, to uh, other endeavors or other troubles. Uh, but beyond the school, and, and uh, I, I, I suspect uh, we won't have to consider terminating what has been a very long and very important relationship with uh, Greeley High School and athletics. And uh, uh, I, I, just, I just think it's all due to individuals, and uh, this too will pass. A couple of bad actors, and they're not going to be around forever. Because uh, we go back, uh, I don't know how long, Keith, but uh, probably uh, more longer than when you were in high school, so that would be at least 50 years that we've been playing. Uh, longer than you've been in there <laughs> This was an opportunity, though. Uh, I, I've had uh, several parents call, and uh, I just want people to know that this did not go unnoticed, and a great deal of energy and time has been uh, spent on this. While we're on uh, athletics and soccer teams, uh, uh, I'd like to just take a minute, Daryl, to uh, read a letter, uh, portions of a letter, a copy of which I received. And, th and the reason that I just want to take a couple minutes, this is from one teacher to another teacher uh, in our middle school. And we get in these meetings and people watch on TV and they hear a lot about the problems. But uh, sometimes to uh, read a letter that goes between one teacher and another uh, reveals a lot and says something about both teachers and something about our school department. And I'm just going to read a couple excerpts. This is a letter signed by Phil Jewett, who is a teacher in the middle school, and written to Roly Moore, who is also a teacher in the middle school and is coach of the girls' state championship soccer team. I just read a couple of excerpts. Dear Roland, as I watched your game last Saturday, I could not help of all the time uh, think I could not help think of all the time, effort, and commitment that you have put into the girls' soccer program over the past 12 years. I'm so pleased for you that the girls won the state championship. I know you've wanted this for many years, and I honestly believe that the credit belongs to you. I think I'm one of the few teachers here in the Cape that can attest to the countless hours you spent in either coaching, talking with kids weekend trips to colleges to support and help an interested student select a college, the summer trips to Nova Scotia or New York to give Cape kids a chance to play and watch quality soccer programs, the summer leagues here in Cape Elizabeth and the indoor leagues in the winter, and you're taking courses and coaching during the summer. Also along with these, you've wheeled and dealed with your fundraisers to keep the soccer program alive when school budgets were slim. Your personality, and then he talks about, he says, you are a master, we have master teachers, you are, in every respect, a master soccer coach. Your personality is such that you do not seek or ask for personal recognition. However, I think in this case, you should be extremely proud and pleased with your program and accept this letter as a small indication of how happy I am for you. Signed, Phil Jewett. Uh, I think that's a wonderful letter uh, between colleagues. And uh, I certainly want people in the community, and I want Phil and Rowley to know that uh, I share in uh, Phil's sentiments, and I'm sure the, other, the rest of the members of the board do as well, as well as the superintendent. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent. I think uh, we've, we've, unless, uh, is there more discussion on the Greeley athletic incident? Anybody? Well, I think that, uh, Sports rowdiness is something that uh, I've read about uh, increasingly, not only in the United States, but in the world press. And I read very carefully the various letters that were uh, written. And I want to commend uh, you know, everybody involved in the administration for those letters, for the stances they took, 
uh, not an easy thing to do, I don't imagine. But uh, I think it was the right thing, and uh, I'm glad you did it. Maybe we could ask Keith. I had spoken, I, uh, I guess you knew this, with the superintendent, and I guess also with you about the possibility of use, use, using this in incident as a catalyst to deal for the schools in our league to deal with what Peter is talking about, which is this, this sports rowdiness that has really come up in the last few years uh, all over the world, really, when it comes to sports. Uh, we don't talk much about, uh, about sportsmanship as a league, throughout the league. And I don't know whether it's asking too much for uh, our, our other schools, the competitor schools, to think about some kind of a code of uh, conduct for students, as well as athletes, in, uh, in, in how they behave at the games, and whether it'll do any good. Could you, could you address that just uh, briefly at the Hello. microphone? I guess I ought to come more often. Um, Besides being on a guest of the day, uh, we also had a Western Maine Conference Athletic Directors meeting today, and that particular issue was discussed in a great uh, detail and a great length today. Um, there are 20 schools that are in our conference, of which Cape and Greeley are two of them, and we talked quite a while about uh, crowd control, rowdiness, sportsmanship, and so forth, and uh, this idea of a, of a code of ethics or sportsmanship whatever you want to call it, was, uh, was discussed in great detail, and it's one of the areas that the uh, athletic directors are going to try to, uh, try to work on. Great. I think that's even, you know, even if it, nothing more can be done than to have some posters printed up with a code adopted by all the schools in the league that could be in hallways of schools and in locker rooms, just to remind kids that of the word sportsmanship, uh, even that alone would be helpful. And, uh, and uh, talks by coaches and, uh, and maybe principals with students could, uh, could, could bring about a greater sensitivity to that. I agree, I, and I think that we're, we're very fortunate with the people that, uh, that we have here. And the conduct of uh, our athletes is, uh, is excellent. And that was just another point at the meeting today in Augusta. One of the things that was brought up was how the, uh, the chairman of the committee wanted to express uh, the extraordinary uh, display of sportsmanship on both the Cape Elizabeth and the Morse coaches and athletes under very difficult circumstances last Saturday, and uh, and he wanted a compliment to go to both schools about the way they handled the, uh, the entire situation. Yeah, that was my observation that both Cape Elizabeth has uh, uh, certainly exemplified good sportsmanship, girls and boys, and I was very impressed with Morse mm -hmm. and Caribou, both of them. They were terrific kids, and uh, the Morse and, and Caribou people were very disappointed, but they were, they were good sports, and they were complimentary to our teams, and uh, uh, I was impressed by that. You know, I think that's one of the things we strive for. Yeah. Thank you. I guess we uh, now move into the... Uh, other part of our agenda, which are the regular items that we deal with on a monthly uh, basis, somewhat more mundane, approval of the minutes of the regular meeting held on October 11, 1988. Everybody has a copy of the minutes. Uh, are there any additions or modifications to those minutes that you know of? If not, I would entertain a motion from uh, one of you to uh, approve the minutes as provided to us. So moved. Is there a second? Second. That? Moved and seconded. All in favor signify by raising your hand. All opposed? The business manager's report. Is this a, is this a detailed report? Uh, no. Is I can answer any questions you have. It's yeah. This is, we, you provided to us the written report. Uh, any questions? That, yes, Michael. Um, No, but would I the resident the resident? Uh, yes. We did. Okay.
Okay, on the business manager's report, are there any questions? <coughs> Anything that particularly concerns you, Mr. Business Manager, and uh, not what at you this see? Point. Not at this point. No red flags? No, not yet. I have a question on the uh, Cato computer system. Sure. Uh, where that stands now, uh, it seems like uh, you wrote a memo to the uh, town manager, uh, which I have here. The town council and the town manager and to the superintendent. What's happened? We presently have uh, 35 million bytes of storage for the town office, the assessor's office, and the school district upstairs. Uh, last June, when we went to do the year end, we had uh, the machine handled it, but it was <coughs> slowed down tremendously because the all the input in that machine, we need to update the uh, or make the hard disk larger. And it's to me, it's an immediate need that should be addressed. I know we're addressing it tomorrow night with the town council, Michael and I. And are, are you uh, going to propose that they spend the $6,000 yeah. to, to upgrade? The 6000 should be split out, 3000 to the school, 3000 to the town. And if uh, that will allow us to do a more sophisticated form of budgeting when you have that additional no. capacity and speed? So still, what it's going to allow us is going to give us more storage. At that point, we might be able to enhance other programs or something. What it is now is so the system is just completely filling up. Well, but let's say you get this, uh, what is it, a Winchester? Or a yeah, a disk drive, Winchester yeah. disk drive. Yeah. Um, wouldn't that give you the additional capacity so that you can add some software uh, that would allow us to do a more complicated or sophisticated form of budgeting? True. If the people that do write the software can come up with something. No. You're looking into that? No. But it's just that, you know, we need to update that system because, the, you know, the, the budgets are growing, the assessors, I mean, the bills are all put on. Everybody's using the machine, which is great. But we need to accommodate the people using it because one of these days it's just going to go. No, I'm all for it. You know? I, I hope uh, it goes well. Yeah, me too. That's what I want to register, that I'm really for it. I think <laughs> you need it. <laughs> I think I made that clear. Mr. Chairman, uh, before you get to the end of the meeting, I'd like just to pass out one thing and make a note, if I may. Yes. Can I do it at this point? Yes, I tell you, I had a couple of things that uh, right. uh, I, I can wait. aren't on the agenda, but uh, I, I would like to just raise and see whether we can get these reflected in the minutes and, and get some response and some dates certain. Um, One of them is, uh, I'd like to see whether you could provide the board with a report on our foreign exchange students and on the program and how it's being run. I know that, uh, I guess the second year I was on the board, this is my sixth, so it was four years ago, uh, we had discussion about this and we had thought that what we ought to do is change the program a little bit to bring in kids from uh, different parts of the world beyond uh, Mexico and beyond just Spanish-speaking countries. Uh, there was some discussion at that time that the program ought not to be a program where you have seven, eight, nine, ten kids come from Mexico, but rather uh, uh, a greater variety of representation and maybe not as many kids total uh, given the size of the school. Uh, we talked about it and we adopted a policy and I'd like to know uh, how closely we're adhering to that policy of getting the variety and maybe shrinking the size a little bit. And if we're not making great headway or haven't made great headway toward that over the last two, three years, uh, I'd like to know uh, what we can do to make greater headway in that direction. But since this is a new board, I'm the only person that was on four years ago. Uh, when you give us that report, uh, recognize that the other four people here are going to have uh, probably a lot of comments and their own views to bring to bear on the issue of the foreign exchange program and how we work it. Would, would the December be a next board meeting? That'd be fine. We'd we'd been, do it. We've been working on that and I, we could make a, a report to you on that at that time. Okay. Uh, I had uh, I had one other item that uh, somebody had spoken to me about 
the number of study hall periods in the middle school i see mr toy is not here but i'd like you to get back with us and talk a little bit about that and i'll tell you what the concern is that people want to some people want to know i'm sure others understand very well but some people want to know what the purpose is of having of students having more than one study hall per day in middle school uh frankly i'd be interested in knowing what the purpose is of having even one study hall per day in middle school because over the years i keep hearing that we need to have more time spent with teachers and students interacting in other words with the with, with the students being in an instructional environment and uh, we talk about longer school days and longer school years in order to increase the, num the, the, the amount of time that a child is interacting with an instructor. So if we're trying to do that, then I'd like to know how this study hall business fits into it. And i also like to know uh, how long we've been having study halls in the middle school, maybe you gotta get somebody with a historical perspective. I know, I, I, they, I know they can't go back beyond 1950 because I was in the eighth grade 1950 in this building and they didn't have study halls. Okay. Anybody wanna to add to that? Well, I did uh, hear one uh, comment uh, this week that uh, I'd like to look into and that is that in shifting around the uh, the classes in the middle school, I have no idea whether this is uh, you know, an accurate count or not, but uh, I heard of a math class that had 27 students uh, in it. And uh, as I recall, our maximum policy there is 24. I didn't look that up, but mm -hmm. uh, it sounded like a lot. It, and I, you know, if Chris were here, he probably could, could answer. But. I worked with Chris on that today and we'll be discussing with the board some possibilities for help. Uh, the fourth, fifth, fourth and fifth grades are getting large and uh, I'll talk to the board about some possibilities of help. The fourth grade particularly, there are 26 in, uh, in with one group that I think uh, we found a way to, to enlarge our reading teacher's scope and uh, by Expanding her load one hour a day, it would help tremendously. You know, when I have all the facts, I'd like to talk to the board about that. But well, don't we have a guideline? Don't we have guidelines? Yes, on how we do. We so do. the 26, the classroom with 26 people in reading instruction exceeds the guideline? By one. So you see, we don't. Well, hire. why didn't we know about it? Because <laughs> it just came to my attention that oh. it's over. Well, that's a good reason. <laughs> Well, I and, think Carol's and, point and, is a good. And very one. often, you know, all we can do is report. We don't generally go hire a teacher for one, you know, for one person only. No, no but the board. To make adjustments. Well, I agree with you, but I think, I think the board uh, needs to know whether the whether we have a case where the guidelines being exceeded, and that your professional judgment is it isn't going to make that much difference, or it might, and and then we give some consideration to what we do. You know, uh, th this is not for discussion tonight, and I don't want to get into this the battle, but I do want to raise the issue because I think we do want to discuss this when you get back to us with more information on how we're solving this problem of larger class sizes in fourth grade, for instance. Uh, you and I talked earlier uh, today about, and I want the board to hear this, and, 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 and the public, frankly, about the fact that we, and maybe this makes good, this is good educational policy, but in our gifted and talented program, we have the theory that these extremely well-motivated, highly intelligent children uh, ought to be in smaller class groups and have intense instruction, uh, whereas kids that may not uh, be part of that highly motivated uh, group 
we don't need to spend, we don't need to have as much uh, personal time with them, smaller class sizes and so forth. And that's something that I hope, I'm sure there's a good answer for that, but I, I'd like to hear it and I'm sure others would as well. Well, uh, let, you want the answer right now? Yeah, let's I'll, have it. I'll be more than well happy to get the it's answer. It's only quarter of nine, let's right. have it. The, uh, the program challenge, which has been in, existing, in existence here for a number of years, uh, deals with approximately 10 youngsters per class. So uh, we're talking about 40 youngsters. Uh, now, those youngsters are selected on a criteria that's been established, uh, teacher recommendation and test. Now, uh, you fall into the category or you don't. But right beside that, uh, you could have a uh, class of young people in a reading group who are reading on advanced levels in other words, they'd be youngsters that are moving along beautifully. And you'd have 24 to 26 in the group. And uh, at the present time, we have a very sophisticated review of the whole challenge program, which started about a month ago. Uh, the State Department people are coming into that review. I talked to the director today, I believe early in December. And uh, we will have a report on the whole challenge program for the board. And I can't tell you what our recommendations are because I haven't seen the report yet. But you're quite right. Uh, historically, uh, we've done the following. We uh, take very highly motivated youngsters in very small groups with excellent teaching and take another group of very good students and almost triple the size. And uh, we have to ask ourselves, is, you know, how cost effective is this? Is this in line with any policy that uh, is rational? And I hope that that's what our review is going to come up so that the board can ask some very good questions once you see the whole facts. And uh, it, it may, uh, we may change uh, or we may recommend changing the entire scope. There are two things that might happen. We might enlarge that kind of uh, instruction at X cost, or we could uh, minimize the number who are actually gifted. And uh, you know, if you go back to term and study, 4% uh, is a large number of gifted youngsters in terms of real giftedness. And uh, some people have narrowed it down to two. Uh, I think the program I spoke about tonight is somewhere around three. But it's regional. You know, when you have uh, 15 or 17 schools, 3% will give you, you know, a few youngsters. But if we took 2% of a class or 3% of a class here, we're talking about a small handful of people. Now, as you also know, our elementary is not a pullout program. The teacher comes in and helps the teacher, you know, motivate a youngster who's very bright. Now that may be, and this is all part of the review, that may be the way we go uh, uh, even beyond the fifth grade, which brings some other complications. Now one thing I will say, the director and uh, the principal of the middle schools on top of this, they're watching the review, as a matter of fact, they're chairing the review, and the people who are doing the review are extremely objective. We're getting as much outside help as we can in this case. Uh, we're trying to keep anybody invested from being on this committee. No parents, anybody that's been part of the whole thing. We want a nice, clean picture of the whole thing. I suspect, and I'm going to ask the director, when we discuss this today, when do you think we'll have our report? I'd like to think about the first of the last So that would be a recommendation prior to budget, right during the budget. Yeah. Great. This is, this is a report by the uh, Department of Education. Well, more than that, it's the it's a careful review yeah. of a committee, the director, the principal, Department of Education's involved. How many people involved in the review? Give or take. Seven. Seven people. And I, I, I want to be sure that we don't understand that it's. Well, wait a minute. You better come up to the microphone because if people can't hear you at home and they'll want to know what you're you're saying. 
I just wanted to clarify that it will not be a report by the Department of Education. They are assisting us in providing some advice, guidance, and consultation. It is a team of people, however, from the community, uh, in inclusive of the school community, of course. So it's, it, it won't be something driven by the department. That's heartening. I know it is. Yeah, yeah that's encouraging. <laughs> For two reasons. Anybody, of course, you've already discussed it, but anyone who has read their report card, their educational assessment report card, would be heartened to know that we're not going to get another report from them soon on anything. <laughs> and uh, I think we need to take a look at this ourselves. I'm beginning. I used to be. Uh, I used to be a uh, big spending liberal, but now I believe in small is good in local control of education. So uh, Peter's taken back by that. But <laughs> it's amazing what 24 hours will do, isn't That's it? Right. That's right. right. Absolutely. Wants to go with the winner. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> may I add my, Mr. Chairman, may, may I add my item? Yes. Fine. Well, wait, and, no. and then we want Michael to, I uh, want to recognize Michael. Go ahead. Um, when we're talking about class size in the fourth grade, although 25 is set as the highest number, I was under the impression that that isn't necessarily the number that we really would like to have in a class, that it would be much better to be down around 23 mm -hmm. than, than up at those levels. And then, then again, it can be the makeup of the class. You know, there may be times when we want, you know, we just want to do certain kinds of things that you can't do with 22 or 20. It all depends on you know the makeup of the, the young people, but uh, I worked with the principal of the middle school today on this, and uh, we'll be bringing back some figures to you. Okay, I think that is a for the future that if there are uh, exceptions to the policies that the board has laid down, even if it's just one, and this may be the old bank auditor in me talking, but I'd prefer to hear it from the administration than to hear it down at uh, Palm Grove hmm. or on the playing fields. Uh, so even though it may seem insignificant, I really strongly urge you to create a system whereby in a very routine way, you know, we get to learn about these things first. All right. Let me make the suggestion that when we give you the uh, enrollment report, we add to it any, any groupings in the school system that violate our policy. So that way you would see where the youngsters are. In the middle of the year, you see, we can have a policy of 22 in the middle of the year and get three kids. So but we, we could report that to you because we're on top of that. It's just a matter of reporting. What's, what's the policy at the high school? The, I, mean, uh, I, I was in a math, a calculus class where I believe the instructor told me he had 29 students, seven of which were 30. 30 ex seven of Francis. which were exchange students. And I was wondering how you could teach a calculus class with 30 students in it effectively. Is, is that, am I correct large. on my numbers, that's, Mr. That's Miles? Correct. So I, I think uh, that. Mr. Miles, again, I want to repeat what you said because the people at home can't hear, but the high school principal said that's correct. There are 30 in the class, and we understand now that of the 30, seven are exchange students. The reason the seven exchange students are there is that they're the math programs that uh, they have been a part of in Spain or Mexico entitle them to take calculus. And that's the appropriate placement for them if they're students in our school. Um, and uh, we are not able to split the class into two. Um, and so Mr. Richards is teaching it uh, with 30 students. And he has not indicated to me that he feels uh, that that is not effective. Um, and so I'm confident in, I accept his judgment. It is a larger class than is typical for the high school, uh, but uh, I think it, I think it's working out reasonably well. And I, I've inquired as to how the exchange students are doing, and they seem to be doing well in that subject. So I, I think it's an appropriate placement. Um, they are in. Um, let's put it this way: their, their science and math curriculums um, uh, are a little more. I didn't want to say advanced in necessarily in technology, but they're, the kids are more advanced in the, in the science programs they've had so far. So that's where they place. 
Mr. Miles, yesterday morning, uh, when I spent some time with you, you were going through a spreadsheet. And as I recall, uh, I said, your range appears to me, looking over your shoulder, mm -hmm. uh, that the class size at the high school runs from eight to 30. And I thought I said, I was interested that the survey courses in English were quite heavy, like 28, 29. No, I don't is think that they're right? that. I don't think they're that large. Uh, I, I think there is some some section uh, variation, and uh, that's something that I want to um, attend to, uh, where, where the opportunity presents itself in the second semester to balance those out. But certainly next year and the scheduling that we will do next year. Um, I think we have to look very carefully at it. Um, the, the smaller classes, I think, exist for particular reasons, and I'm trying to remember some of the numbers on that Lang spreadsheet. It was language three, four, and five. Yeah, I think I that, that in the advanced levels of languages, there are, are smaller classes, um, um, and I think our, our question is, do we offer a complete language program? That is, once a student starts in Spanish one, if they want to take it through Spanish 5, I think we ought to support that, and the same is true in, in, in French. Our new, program, th our new program should uh, enlarge those classes I think significantly. So. I think so, and, and I think that our new program in time will enlarge the number of language classes in general at the high school. Why, why is it not possible to have two calculus classes? Uh, <clears throat> I think it's simply a number of se the number of, s of preparations and sections that each teacher teaches. Uh, we, we don't, each teacher teaches five classes, and at the moment there are no teachers walking around with, with four, if you will, um, that, that uh, um, we could easily s split it. Um, I'd take another look at that and see to, to make sure that I'm correct in that, but that's uh, my recollection. Um, at the moment I don't have any information with, you, with me that would allow me to give you a definitive answer, but I will look at it. And it, it, it also may be, uh, uh, yeah, I think that's probably the, the where we leave it. Any more questions for Frank? Thank, Thank you. you very much. You're welcome. I'm very pleased uh, to pass out uh, the first report on curriculum. And the reason why I'm doing it is uh, this is the process. It was developed and designed by our curriculum director. I'd like to pass it out so that we could discuss it at the December meeting. And it's a very important document. I'm very pleased. Now, there are additional documents, but we aren't ready. What we'd like to do is, in December, just discuss the process. And I would like to give it to you this evening so you have a whole month to read it. It's well done. And it's from the curriculum director, who's sitting with us this evening. But Daryl, one of the, the things occurs to me, thinking yes. about curriculum, uh, at some point, are you going to give us your analysis and comparison of SAT scores in Cape Elizabeth vis-a-vis -vis Westchester? Westchester? You see, uh, I'll pass on my secret. Uh, I have received a note from the person that sends it to me. Oh. Until that's published, I cannot get it. And when it's published, it's published in the paper in Westchester. She sends it to me. Okay. That's how I get it. Now, I could call to see if uh, what's happened. But the latest, and that was just a few weeks, a few days ago. Yeah. Last right. week. So it'll be sometime in the next couple of months. Just as soon as I get it. We'll get that. We just want to see how smart kids from Scarsdale are. Okay, Michael, welcome. Welcome. We we're glad to see you again. Harold, since <clears throat> I have a question to ask you before we do this. Since you use the L word. Yes. Uh, what I mean, what I used to be, but I don't talk about it anymore. You're saying you're no longer a liberal? <laughs> well, we're, we're on. TV. <laughs> yep, I'm willing quarter. to tell you privately <laughs> that I'm a liberal, but uh, I can't say that public. I can't use that word here on television. Your word. The, uh, the document you have in front of you uh, outlines a process.
process for doing curriculum review. And um, I meet with a curriculum committee once a week. The curriculum committee is made up of uh, uh, Wayne and uh, the three pr principals, Frank, Chris, and Barbara, and the assistant principal, Rick Defusco, at the high school. And I've had a lot of help from that, from that group in, in uh, writing this. I put down on purpose right at the top there, this is what, what, what you're seeing is the third draft of this now. And I, uh, I don't expect this to be the last draft. I expect this to be rewritten a number of times before we have a document that we all like. So I want to encourage you to read it carefully, um, to edit it, to add, to add, to add what you'd like. It's it's really meant to be worked on. It's not being presented to you like a like a complete thing. Um, we have what I'm going to do in in the next month because um, things things really are moving along. I've used this process in a draft way to start to, to start looking at where we are in various uh, subject areas. Uh, English, social studies, math, science, foreign languages. That, and, and this process outlines very nicely where we are in terms of curriculum development, what the next steps need to be in order to move the process along. So at the point that, uh, that you adopt a process, I think it'll be shortly thereafter, I could, we could begin writing up tables and flow charts that show you exactly where we are in curriculum, exactly what the next steps will be. But I think the process by which we do it is really critical. And, um, and so I present it to you separately. Um, let's see if there's anything else I wanted to say. I'm going to start sharing this document now with uh, faculty and with parents for more editing and for more review. Uh, outs outside of our uh, curriculum group and some of the curriculum people in the schools, um, you're, you're the first to see it. Uh, Michael, I have one question. Why does it take so long to do this? What I wear, I see one to two years, one to, one to two years for phase one, one to two years for phase two. So it could be five years or in the fifth year when we begin to implement this program, which means that most of the kids that are presently in school now are not really going to benefit greatly from your work. Uh, we're, not, we're not at phase one in all curriculum areas. There's a number of places where we're, where we're midstream in process. Okay, so it's not like starting at phase one in every single subject there. Mm. But uh, I, I agree with you. There's, there's a real tension. There's a tension between the immediacy of wanting to serve the kids uh, right now and the, uh, and the time and the thought it takes to do uh, change and innovation correctly. But is there, are there things during this five-year period, this is five years an outside number here, but during this five-year period, you're going through this process. Uh, is there going to be any opportunity to simultaneously deal with some crisis areas in the curriculum, some things where we really have some big problem and you can fix it at least with a bandage, a band aid, or put a cast on it uh, until you get the whole body fixed? We we do that now, and that's one of our problems over the years, there have been yeah. too many band-aids. I just would like to mention the ASCD, the American Association for Curriculum Development, last year, headlined, and this is probably the biggest group in the country, headlined that we should start helping people to realize that the revision of curriculum is a 10 to 15 year process. The Scandinavians think of 15 years to change the curriculum. So uh, all too often we thought of it, you know, in two short terms, and it hasn't worked. But uh, I would hope that uh, we would establish priorities 
where we feel we have weaknesses based on our analysis. Yeah. Just the way uh, we're doing at the present time math. That's because it was a high priority. And I would hope next year we would all determine what the highest priority is. And as we go along for the next five years, we establish those priorities. Uh, for example, here's a priority I don't think we've discussed yet. I think we need a health education uh, program that's going to be K-12 as soon as we possibly can. And uh, you see, there, there's, been a, there's been a health program in this school system, I'm sure, for a hundred years, but not the kind of health program that we need for today. Now, we're, we put a Band-Aid on the high school, ninth grade, junior high school, and the Quest program. These are Band-Aid jobs. What I'd like to see us do eventually is get a K through 12 sequential affair that we feel very reasonably certain that our youngsters are getting reinforced all the way through. Okay. Drug abuse is a good example. But aren't there areas, don't we have problems with the sequences off where we can, while we're going through this big planning process here, if there's an area where we've got obvious sequential problems that can be corrected, that one, one thing comes to mind, I'm familiar with eighth grade, and I know some of the kids that are in algebra this year in eighth grade, well, when they were in seventh grade, they had pre-algebra. Whereas another whole class of kids has nothing to do with the levels, had to do with who the teacher was, didn't have pre-algebra. So it seems to me that's the kind of thing that you mean. You mean they still took algebra and did okay? This, is that, is they're that in algebra mean? in eighth grade, but some, half of them, because it's an, uh, however you divide them up into sections in seventh grade, whether it's alphabetical or whatever, but if, you're in the wrong, if it was alphabetical, if you were in the wrong end of the alphabet, you didn't have any pre-algebra toward the end of your seventh grade math, Just while there. if your name began with a different letter, you did have pre-algebra. Now both the person that, whose name belongs with B, and the, uh, begins with B, and the person whose name belongs with Z, go into the eighth grade algebra course, B had some pre-algebra that's very helpful in eighth grade algebra, Z had no pre-algebra. And you can, and I happen to know about that, uh, that, a lot about that situation. I'm saying to myself, this is something that we should be able to correct without a five-year program. That, I agree. Now, you Except only find out about it when you go through this first phase of the process mm -hmm. and you come up against these kinds of I issues. But I think it's something well, we we're should going to, What we're going to find, I think what, what we already know, but, but we'll, we'll document it more, the, the sequencing problems in math uh, exist at virtually every grade level, uh, not just eighth grade. Uh, the repetition from grade to grade virtually right through the whole, the whole program is, uh, uh, is awful. And, and so, in fact, the sequencing problems in math is, is systemic. It's a problem right through. It's not, it's not just an eighth grade thing to cure. It's How a big long one. does it take to change something like that? Um, it depends on how far we, it depends on how far we get with uh, Rachel McAnellan this year on, uh, on what kind of summer training we could set up for next year. I, I, I'm hoping uh, well, let me answer it two ways, okay? I, I can imagine us getting into a piloting phase, a phase two piloting phase in math by next year. That, that's possible. That's very quick. But we might be able to do it because we've had such high participation and such high enthusiasm uh, and with our faculty K-8 uh, uh, in what we're doing with math right now. Okay, so maybe we'll get to pilot another way to do it as early as next year. On the other hand, um, you know, the history of change, the history of innovation is replete with uh, cases where new programs are brought in. Uh, it looks great, it looks spectacular, everybody is very happy and everybody feels they did a great job in year one. And then you take a look at it three years later, and it's been thrown out, and people are kind of doing what they always did. 
And that's more typical of bringing new programs in than not. And, and the, way you, uh, the way you guard against that, the way, the way you don't, how should I put it? In some ways, the longer you stretch out phase one, the more likely the success of what you do. So even though we, chances are, there is a chance we might get to do some piloting as early as next year in math, and that would be exciting. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, I feel the tension. On the other hand, I don't want to rush it because I know the quicker it goes, the more likely it's going to die three years later. Because that's, that's, the, his, that's the research. Over and over again, the history, when you look at the research about change and research about how to develop program, uh, uh, you find results like this. I, just uh, an academic question. It would seem to me that uh, 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 100 years ago, somebody would have purchased in Cape Elizabeth a series of textbooks on mathematics which would have been sequential. And all teachers would have been using them and... That's what we do. That's what we do. The textbooks build in ski sequencing and repetitive problems that are horrendous. Somebody used the term spiral in connection with yeah. that. Is that a yeah. technical term? That's, that's the it's, argument. I've heard it. I, uh, it uh, and I don't think it's true. I think it's certainly, it. you know, with regard to your comment, uh, Daryl, about the Swedish system, I'm sure you're talking, when you mentioned 15 years, a national curriculum. Here's some of them. Uh, Best I mean, example we have here that I've seen since I've been here, and these people can help me. From the day the board said they want to change the writing behavior of our students and its skill to the 11th grade test in writing. Now that whole system, this system has devoted money, energy, people to help the youngsters write. And we can look at their writing right now with the assessment skills. I, I think that the board started this five years ago when all the teachers took the Bay Writing Program. Am I right on the year, give or take? So now that's one section of this curriculum that we know where the board said this is a high priority. We're going to put money and people and teachers are going to take the Bay Writing and change the writing patterns of the differences. And now you look at the writing scores and our writing scores as determined by the main assessment anyway are pretty good. Uh, I, I don't think, I can't see any other discipline in the school system that I can say that about. Am I missing something? That's why we have a curriculum director, and that's why we're doing what we're doing. Well, I don't, I don't, I just think that uh, it's scary to hear 15 years. It's not so scary to hear five. We are one of more than 15,000 school systems in the country. Obviously, we're a much smaller planning unit than the country of in Sweden. You know, Sweden. So, we ought to be able to achieve some uh, acceleration in the process. Jan. Thank you. I've had parents ask me um, with the math consultant, you know, they've heard how turned on <clears throat> teachers and, and students are by this, why it's optional for teachers whether or not they want to take part in, these, um, in this program. And some kids then are going to benefit and other kids whose teachers maybe don't choose to go to this are, are not getting it. When you start, well, if you, read the, if you read the document, you start in phase one uh, with teachers beginning to explore present program, with them looking at needs analysis, with them trying to, to take a hard look at what's good and what's bad about present program. You start looking at new directions, and the teachers who are most interested begin exploring and mucking around with new ways of doing things. Um, you don't mandate implementation until phase three when you know you have a new program, you've, you've piloted it, you've adapted it, you've uh, seen what's right with it and what's wrong with it, and you're convinced that you're ready for 100% participation. But, uh, but is it, we're, we're I, not there. I understand about mandating, you know, having to do it, but 
Is it wrong to mandate at least exposure to it? Well, I tell you, I, um, what I, I wouldn't have. I mean, I would say what we're doing in math is really phase one, where people are taking a look at a new way of doing math. It's going to be a hard job to take this way of doing math, which, which I happen to think is far more powerful uh, you know, than what we've been doing, but to build a scope and sequence and build an articulated curriculum with this way that we're training teachers is, a, is going to be hard work. Uh, but aren't some of the teachers already beginning to use some of these things that they've learned with Rachel in the classroom already? That's so right, that a lot of teachers. To back up what Jan is saying, then those teachers that haven't attended the sessions are there not using those skills. Mm -hmm. but, but you have. You have that kind of mixture when you, when you just start at phase one of a process. And the thing that's remarkable about what's going on with Rachel is, is in K-8, you got something like 95% of the teachers who voluntarily are doing it. There's very few teachers who haven't joined. That's remarkable. And, and at this early phase, where, where it, it's a wonderful statement, I think, about the got an overwhelming number of teachers who are saying, I'm kind of not happy with the way we're doing math right now, and I'm real interested to learn some, another way of doing it. We have, more, we have a lot more work to do to take this, ki this kind of mucking around with manipulatives that we're doing now and really building a careful program with it. That, that's that's going to be a ways to get there. I'm saying there's an outside <coughs> shot. We may get there by next year. But... Uh, the participation of the teachers has been incredible. It's, it's, it's wonderful, and it, hasn't been, and it hasn't been required. The same thing holds true for other areas. We're simultaneously doing a number of things, for example. Some people are in whole language, not 100%, but that's being piloted at the present time. Uh, the science program, where we purchase all these kits, I'm sure that there are differences between people. Some are more comfortable with the the hands-on approach than others. Uh, but I think that has to develop. If this is the way it's going to be, though, I think that ought to be made clear to the parents at the beginning, that we are bringing in a math consultant. It's optional whether or not the teachers want to be part, and your child may or may not be exposed to this. Because a lot of parents don't understand that. Well, one, th one thing I want to do is I want to start taking this this draft of process mm. and start sharing it with parents also. Because I think we all need to have a sense about how this curriculum development is going to go. Be because especially in the initial phases, you're going to have different teachers doing different things because you want to experiment around. And at the initial phases, well, let, let me argue this. Um, it's not until you pilot some of the new ideas that you really can start saying with any certainty that what you're doing is really going to be better than what you did before. And if we start piloting something that turns out to be pretty weak, then it's the teachers who didn't bite who are going to, who, who are going to have uh, uh, the better program. And, 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 and part of what we want to do here is we want to allow people to take risks. We want to allow people to explore different directions. There's no guarantee that every time we start moving in a certain direction, we're really going to we're really going to build the better program until we pilot it, and we and we get evaluative with it, and and, and we see how it really goes. Michael, my old friend, you really got me worried. Now I started out here saying, "Well, we're t we've been handed this thing. We're going to discuss it at the next meeting, and uh, we'll read it between now and December," but. You're talking an awful lot about piloting and innovation and creativity and so forth and uh, experimenting. And of course, the kids are the guinea pigs. That's always the case in education. And uh, make me feel better. I'm getting very worried now that we're going to go through a period of great upheaval here 
in this school system. We've done it before. We had periods of great upheaval and uh, innovation here, uh, not just in this school district, but others around the country about 20 years ago. And uh, we got people that don't even know how to write very well. Well educated, went to college. I thought we were talking about curriculum is, I thought we were talking about uh, things like sequence, bringing order out of the curriculum, making sure that when you go K through 12 that you're, you're, you have building blocks, that uh, we were talking about uh, how to uh, motivate kids to learn how to, how to teach, teach them. And I understand that there's some innovation involved in that, but uh, I'm worried that we're going to create programs that we're just going to be, we, we're so program oriented in education. You know, we go down to uh, Wheelock and s spend a summer and come back and say, let's do this one. No offense to elementary school teachers, but I mean, seriously, you, 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 they're talking about such and such a program at the University of Illinois. Let's do it. No, that's not what we're doing. We're doing everything you talked about, and we're adding the technology of instruction, which has changed very much. Much of our math person here is technology not the changes in math. It's the technical aspects of how to teach the math, the pedagogy, that makes it real different. So we're not going to go pick a pilot program from here and there and there, that sort of thing. It's my feeling, if as I, and I've been here now three years, I think what's happened from a curriculum point of view is that this is a small community that relied very heavily on quality teachers and gave them uh, a great deal of leeway as to what they could do in the classroom. That's the reason why I showed you seven different texts from various companies that in no way could have any sequence because they were competing with one another. Now, I think for a number of years this is what happened. And fortunately, like very many of your private schools with excellent people, it worked to a, a pretty good extent. But I think we've got to a point now where we can't have any holes in the curriculum. It's too important. So sequence is going to be a very important thing. But as Michael's paper will indicate, we've got to think of the technology. Now the computer is the technology. Is a, it wasn't even around here when you were here. Mm. Well, we didn't have television. I hate to say that. Fortunately, <laughs> is true. Let me make. Well, I think what we're doing now is making a mistake, which is we're discussing this paper. <laughs> read I it. haven't read it. <laughs> I've seen one little picture in here in the middle, and uh, I just think we ought to stop and we'll right. read this paper and then yeah. come back to it. Unless sure. Michael has some sort of exhortation that he wants to deliver to us uh, that we should bear in mind. He's while delivered we read his paper. exhortation, and I've gotten nervous. And that's enough. We'll discuss it next meeting. Thank you, Michael. You're welcome. All right. That uh, uh, completes the, uh, the agenda of the regular meeting, except the date for the next meeting, which is the December. What did you say? Well, no, December, the, the first Tuesday is December 6th. Second Tuesday is December 13th. And I think that's the date. Is, if that's all right with everybody, December 13th. Maybe I have to put another day. Okay, anything else? <laughs> no, it's in September. I thought the president made that in September. <laughs> Well, you're going to get in trouble. <laughs> uh, the, uh, if there's no other business, I'll entertain a motion to go into the executive session for the purpose of discussing contract negotiations. So moved. Motion has been made and seconded to go into negotiations for the purpose of, I mean, <laughs> into executive session for the purpose of discussing negotiations. A second. All in favor? All right. Thank you all for attending. Yes, sir. Yes. 
You may. Notice you do not have at the end of your agenda openings for citizens of the town to participate. Good point. May I you sure may. Why don't you go? No, no. May I uh, expect to see this on the next agenda? Yes, you will. Because I would like to address the board. We'd like you to do it right now, Ed, and you will see it on the agenda at the next meeting, but you've been here and you've waited all night. Go up to the microphone. Up to the microphone, Ed, so they can hear you. I'm trained. It's been a while since I've... Uh, been to a school board meeting and uh, this is Ed Capano. And my name is Ed Capano and I live at 528 Spurwink Avenue. I have been a teacher incidentally in the CAPE system for 17 years. I've retired uh, for the last 11 or 12 and thoroughly enjoying it. <laughs> uh, but I guess, I, shall we point out also that your wife is one of the most popular teachers in Cape Elizabeth school system as well? well. Thank you, Peter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I, uh, Peter, may I reiterate your compliments uh, to uh, Rolly Moore and Thor Nielsen for the splendid uh, job that they did with the boys and the girls. Um, I've known Rolly for a long time. I've no, I have just a brief acquaintance with Thor, um, but Rolly has been a very conscientious individual. Uh, for the Cape Elizabeth school system and the boys and girls. But I had a couple of points here I'd like to uh, uh, bring out and talk to you about. I was very interested in the superintendent's remark. Uh, I, I want to make sure I heard this correctly. Am I to understand that the high school will require no payments shortly? Is that what I heard you say? No payment. You said something about the high school. There would be no payment on the high school. That was, uh, I believe, you were talking that's, about the boilers, weren't you? What, what was that? Some, sometime ago, we purchased boilers. Oh, oh. Debt okay. on the high school okay. is over. The high school debt is over in last year's budget. Mm -hmm. So if you compare budget to budget, right. there's going to be a sum of money because that would be used for accessibility. I was a little bit surprised, but I thought that was great news if that was going to be the case. Uh, um, do you have any knowledge as to whether we're still paying on a Robert B. Lent school? Yes. The only debt service we have currently is the high school. Is debt the high school service. and the boys. Okay. And the ADD is the mm -hmm. What will happen to the community service surplus? The community surf uh, the the community service surplus is. Uh, actually put back in and carried over in, in uh, the education budget. So that will help to create prob probably a surplus in the education bu uh, educational budget? Well, I don't know whether it created a surplus in the education uh, budget. What, what n normally happens is that it is, carried, uh, it is carried forward in the education budget. And it is, uh, to the extent that there's a surplus in community services, it, uh, it simply reduces the requirement for increased taxes. For a redu reduction in taxes. Well, reduces the re right? reduces the requirement right. for increases okay, in okay. the tax rate. All right, fine, that's good. Um, was made mentioned a little earlier when you weren't here, Peter, that um, you had a discussion with the town council. There was, there was a meeting with the town mm -hmm. council, that's correct. Uh, this summer, I walked the athletic fields that were just reseeded uh, and so forth. They are really some in some sad state of affairs. Now, do I address Michael and the town council on this, or do no, I address you people? You can you can address us on it because uh, we anticipated you were going to tell us about that, Ed. <laughs> and uh, a month ago, uh, I bought those fields too, mm -hmm. and those fields are in, uh, not in good shape. No, they're not. And um, the director of community services, the athletic director, the superintendent, the town manager, and the director of the public works department met in this building a month ago to discuss the condition of those fields. 
and uh, I think we're all satisfied that there's going to be some emphasis given to the fields. We were, we were provided with a list of things that they were going to be doing this fall and next spring. One conclusion is well, they're going to be doing a lot of things to the fields to try to, to, to improve mm -hmm. them this fall so with the spring uh, growth, but we may have to stay off the new fields next spring. That, that would not be surprising yeah. at all. Uh, because I, I'd hate to see the children go on those fields and get caught into in any one of the little holes and wrench the knee or whatever. And once the knee is wrenched, you have a real problem, yeah. as you There's well know. As many holes on that yeah. one soccer oh. field as there are on the moon. So that, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> there was a hole in the bank by the track. I noticed it's filled in. Yeah. I understood from uh, the when I attended the town council meetings that eventually a some kind of a field house was going to be put in somewhere there. That's correct. Is that a possibility yes. or that, is that, that, that is a window? probability a that probability. there will be a field house? But there is a committee working on the location of the field house. Mm -hmm. That committee has not is yet to reach a final conclusion. We hope to hear from them soon and they'll make a recommendation as to uh, where the field house should be uh, put. Do you know if within the structure there will be uh, an arrangement for the selling of hot dogs and et cetera and et cetera? Well, that has been the original plan to have that in this superintendent. Is that still alive, that there would be a That's concession it. stand as part of it? It's going to be considered. It's going to be considered? Okay. Uh, Years ago, when uh, the item of, I, I have no knowledge of the incident that happened between Greeley and Cape Elizabeth. I'm a little bit disturbed because in all the years that I've coached uh, the athletic teams in Cape Elizabeth, one of my, the criteria was that uh, we are gentlemen and ladies first, and we go from there. But. Um, there was a time when I first came into the system that a banner was given to the school that had the best sports conduct. And that included primarily the spectators. Now, That's I, a terrific idea. Well, it, was, it, it had been done for years. And I don't know what happened to it, but I think with all things, changes do come about, or we forget about doing this or that. But I like to think that maybe, um, I was in hopes that Keith might be here because he might be able to back me up on it, uh, to bring this back into play. Well, they're studying, uh, he reported earlier tonight, this, that they're, they're looking at ways to improve uh, sportsmanship. And I think we'll ask the high school superintendent, Mr. Miles, if he wouldn't in the next couple of days uh, bring that suggestion to the attention of the athletic director that maybe this group, this league group, could annually vote, send in a ballot as to which school they think best exemplified the standards of sportsmanship, which we hope all of these schools would adhere to. Mm. That's a good idea. And then the, t the, the, the town or the school for the greatest number of votes that year would get a big banner to hang in their gym which would say Cumberland York League or whatever uh, sportsmanship what, of the, the award. Used to be Triple C when, yeah. when I was here. And I think the banner went from school to school. Yeah. So well, you, had to, you had to earn it to, in order to keep it a second year. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's, 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 that's a good idea. Okay. And may I just in, have your indulgence for one more comment. Uh, years ago, uh, the police department had a program with the school department whereby a police officer, especially, I hope he was specially trained or whatever the case may be, came to school to speak to our youngsters on any topic and explain the very simple basic laws of the land. Is there any feeling in the discussion that you may have had, I, I noticed Mrs. Pond mentioned the chief of police was there. Is there any uh, inclination 
that way again as far as either the school board or the police or whatever the case may be? Or do you want it? That's the other question, you see. Well, I don't think there was any discussion about that, about having an officer come into the, school. into the uh, schools and maybe Mr. Superintendent, the, the elementary school uh, principal might the fire, the fire chief and the firemen come into the schools, but do we have any program with the police go with, into with the elementary? Well, it was discontinued yeah. some time back, but I wonder if it kind of might want to revitalize it. One thing I might add is uh, we work very closely with the police, mm. and the high school works very closely with the police. The new principal of the middle school works very closely with the police. Uh, one of the things I, I will say about our chief He's very cooperative about uh, mutual understanding. I'll give you a good example. He uh, just wrote a letter to every administrator in the system uh, asking if they wanted to, uh, they wanted to, uh, in the evening, go with squad, squad car to get some feeling for the community that they're welcome to just call in, take a two hour trip. With them. So, uh, one of the things, uh, he gives us a report periodically as to what's going on in the community, and we report to him on what's going on in the school. So I'm very pleased with the cooperation with the police. But we don't formally, formally have them in, you know, to lecture. Ed, thank you for taking the time to come here tonight and, uh, and to share your views with us. We appreciate it very much. I'll be back again. Great. We look forward to it. You may not like it. Oh yeah, no, we like to have public participation. We really do. We, uh, we feel as though we don't get enough. Thank you, people. Okay. Thank you. you know, I think, that, I think that is something that needs to be on our agenda. Yeah. I'm not sure if it needs to be last or first. Uh, I think maybe first, actually. Well, first, I think with a, uh, perhaps well, a I time Well, I think early limit. in the evening. Well, I don't know. I think it's something that perhaps we should discuss, but that sure. has been brought to my attention by some citizens, that they had never been in a community that didn't have a, a, some opportunity for the public to speak. Well, we've always had, uh, we've never had it on the agenda, but I, I believe uh, all the years I've been here, people come in and say, may I be heard, and they've always been heard. Certainly. So there's always, uh, everybody has been always welcome to speak, and, and they have over the years, but I think Ed's suggestion is a good one that you put it on the agenda, it's a little more inviting. And I think that lets new citizens know, you yeah. know they don't know the past history of the, the, you know, the casual. Right. I think also if it's on at the beginning, people know they can come, say what they have to say, and then not have to sit and listen right. while we go through all our ministerial mm -hmm. duties. That's a, that's a, it's a good suggestion, and we'll, 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 we'll do that, and we'll also continue the tradition that even if they later in the meeting have something to say on an issue, they can come and say it. Okay. Done. Now, we already went into executive session. You know, I, I'd hate to see if, if, it, if it's written in there that they're temporary blinds and they're going to be removed, then I, I think that uh, you wouldn't have a problem with seeing uh, 10 or 12 blinds dotted all over that marsh. I don't, I don't think anybody really like to, to, to see that. So. I, 
I think both three and four, the, the two things that, that came up, blinds and cutting vegetation for blinds, um, I'm not going to be down there, nor do I think any, anybody coming in after me or that works at, at the refuge causing a problem. It's, it's, it's not the intent, but um, it, this can be reworded, I suppose, to provide for that. As I said, we could intersect the word dead. Um, well, I think it should be work, reworked a little bit. And besides, is blinds going uh, yearly, as you might say, and you have to remove them every year. I, I don't think that would go over very good with the hunters because they like to have a structure that by their pond there all year round. And so the birds are used to what is there. Then you go plump a new one down there and it takes a little while for them to get used to it. And there's some that have been there for years, and I mean years and years, and in the same spot. And all they are is on those staddles, and they've cleaned out, and you've seen them, and there's one that's been in the family for a good number of years. Okay. We have, Mr. Jordan? Yes. We have, uh, we have uh, several other divisions that are open to hunting, and on each of those divisions, I know on the Upper Wells Division, we have uh, at least four blinds that are, in a sense, grandfathered. And uh, they can be, they can be um, maintained and used. They don't have to be removed. All new blinds are temporary blinds, and we require them to be removed. This is where we hold entire, you know, sole interest in the property. Um, if if blinds, you know, I I used to waterfall waterfall hunt myself. I don't anymore. But um, if if those blinds are put up ahead of the season. They don't necessarily need to be there all the season because you are hunting a migratory bird that's moving through. If those blinds are uh, put up and removed the whole time they're there is not during the growing season, then I can accomplish um, what, what I would like to see accomplished and the hunter could still engage in their activity with little or no impact on, on their uh, particular interest. No, number eight. It speaks of motor vehicles, use of motor vehicles, including boats powered by motors and aircraft in place of emergency. Now, what you're prohibiting is if at the high tide, if somebody comes up through there in a motorboat, that's illegal? No. That's, no. That's legal. That's, that's going to be legal, that's right? Legal. Okay. How about all train vehicles, them four-wheelers and whatever? How are we going to control those? Well, it says here that that, that they are, um, this is use of motor vehicles um, and aircraft. It's saying that they're, um, it's, you, can't, you can't use them on the property. Um, they, if, if you permit ATVs to, to ride around out there, four-wheel drive, um, it, causes a, it causes a real mess and it takes many, many years I, I understand the problem. You have to go into that. But do you feel motor vehicle covers ATVs? That's my oh, question. Oh, yeah, a motor vehicle. It's a vehicle driven by a motor. Oh, I, I misunderstood your question. Yes, it does cover ATVs. Okay. <clears throat> I think that's all I have. Andy, I have a couple of questions. Um, I remember our past conversations, and the point came up that the, the marsh has never been managed, and some of us, or maybe all of us, feel that it should have been and should be. Um, but I, I think I note a little concern among the, the council members about the, the degree of control that the town is going to have over your management activities. What if um, you propose to um, do something about the duck blinds that really caused an uproar in the town. Would we, as representatives, have any control over your actions, any negotiation powers with with your folks? As far as as far as duck blinds, um, I, I don't want to go into those specifically. No, I, I, I think just, we have it's already. Hard, it's hard to talk in, in general because um, you're looking for a specific answer to a, a general question, and it's, it's very difficult for me to respond to that. 
primarily we're going to manage that area. Uh, the whole reason we were trying to enter into this agreement was to to, um, to, to manage the area in its natural condition, basically for the benefit of the fish and wildlife resource, and that's how that's how we're going to to manage it. Um, and as I, I went over before, a number of different management proposals or activities I may engage in, and if, if something like that did cause a problem, that is something that uh, um, would be worked out. Um, You're saying know. basically then that we have not, the town has not relinquished all control no. over no, that no, resource? No, no, I'm not. You are not saying that? seems to me that we should have a provision that spells out the, the procedure by which um, we, we would come to an agreement uh, once a disagreement had occurred. There should be some sort of procedure. The town ought to be notified as to what your proposals are, what you plan to do. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any... Uh, well, in, There's no mention of that, is it, there? Well, in, number, in number nine, it, it talks about it. I think something could be um, included in that paragraph to state that we will notify you. It says we'll notify you of construction and uh, excavation and things like that, uh, but maybe we could... In, in well, I think your plan also, management. we should be notified of your plan. That's what I mean. Your management right. plan. Um, and we also should um, give some consideration to a process. If, if for some reason there's disagreement between your folks and us, it seems to me there ought to be a process for sitting down and working through that. Yeah, you could. How you about could, the Conservation yeah. Commission being your arbitrator? The Communities Conservation Commission. Well, ultimately, though, it's it's the council that is the decision making. Certainly, you could work through them first, but I would yeah. think that ultimately it should be the council that agrees or disagrees. I would think that you would have to work very closely with the Conservation Commission and with the council <coughs> as you plan your management. Now, I think that we would like to know what your plans are in advance. Well, as I said earlier, we would be notifying you of our plans in advance. The only thing we, that I guess isn't addressed in here is what would happen in the event that there is a, uh, a stalemate mm -hmm. on a particular okay. project. Okay. Okay. I, I hope that Michael will work with you to make sure that... Uh, some process is spelled out. And the other thing that uh, concern, concerns me is I see no mention of management of the resource for the general public's uh, enjoyment, recreational enjoyment, and education. The marsh ought to be a place where school kids can go and learn about the various forms of vegetation and the biology of a marsh. And in conjunction with that, I just want to mention something that I brought up before, and that is I think you should be thinking about a nature trail along the edge of the marsh. Because uh, it's been brought up before, the general public does not really have access to that marsh. And there should be a controlled access, it seems to me. Maybe that isn't important to other uh, councillors, but I would like to see a provision in this agreement for that. In, in number three, it talks about buildings and structures, and it says, except as needed to provide access for the public. Uh, there is the, in, in number three, um, there is the possibility of putting in uh, a, a nature trail or an interpretive nature trail and that's at the, uh, at the discretion of really the, the community or the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or both to, together. Yeah. Um, as far as having access to the property, us picking up that property is not going to change access at all because we're picking up, picking it up. It's going to be 
in public ownership and you can access that property along any of our boundaries provided you're not trespassing on but what yeah but else. what I'm saying is for the general public uh, there is not an organized access to the marsh and there is no mention of recreational enjoyment and education which I think is is very important in managing these uh, natural resources I personally would like to see a provision. Yeah, I, I, I agree that, that that is very important to um, fish and wildlife management. Uh, we do have an area on the Upper Wells Division is designated for high public use and we provide, uh, we have an interpretive trail that's wheelchair accessible, it's a little over a mile long. Uh, some of the other divisions we try, we, we concentrate more on uh, fish and wildlife management because we are a, a that's the type of agency, agency that we are. And in uh, previous meetings before the council, uh, I did state that if there is an interest in the community to provide some type of uh, formal access that I would be uh, more than happy to, uh, to cooperate with the community and, and, and develop something. Um, but again, what I'm saying is I would like to see this in the agreement so that it could be a goal, perhaps, for the future. And I think Michael is willing to work with you. He's got yes. a list here um, of several of the comments that have been made. And we're not being critical of the agreement. It's just that we would like to see some additional language. Michael. Just, there may still be more council concerns to come forward, but maybe to summarize at this point, of what I understand you, you would like to see. Uh, first, is more information on the appraisal. How is the amount arrived at? Uh, are there comparable amounts? Secondly, uh, better provision on permitting duct blinds in paragraph three, issue on what limits perhaps there should or should not be. Uh, to look into reporting mechanisms to not to you know, both uh, pre-reporting and post-reporting. Uh, what I mean by that is a, a notification of a plan beforehand what is going to be done and then a follow-up report of, of what, in fact, has been done. To look at uh, what if there are disagreements, uh, should there be a process for arbitration, uh, who should be the arbitrator. To look into a reversionary clause, uh, if it's we come to the feeling that uh, they just aren't managing it the way that the town uh, feels the agreement provided for, that uh, there would be a, a provision. And the issue of public education, recreation, uh, nature trail uh, to permit uh, that to take place. That's what I have so far. Jane. Uh, I'd like to consider one other item, and that would be having an appraisal done uh, by another party, uh, someone that the town would hire. Given all of the restrictions that we want put on the land, uh, I'd like to see another independent appraisal done. Councilor Tory. My, just from a professional's point of view, as you've managed other properties throughout the state and elsewhere in your career, is there any problem with the coexisting? I'm just trying to think in my mind of the problem with the coexisting with the educational nature, recreational side that, that Councilor Masterson just emphasized, and also the right of the hunters and the hunting. You know, and, and what I'm wondering is if you allow plentiful and bountiful hunting in an area that has also been, you know, uh, the, the citizens of Cape have been told to go down there and utilize it for walking trails, et cetera. Is, is, this, is this coexistence happening elsewhere? Is it, is it present a hazard to the public? I can see if both, if both sides of those really started taking off, you could have some problems certain times of the year. We refer to that as user conflict. Um, yes, That's we do. what I was like. I knew there was a <laughs> good term for that. Well, we, have, we had to, uh, a couple of years ago, or actually it was at a previous station, Form an evaluation and try and identify user conflicts. And yes, it does. Uh, if you have a hunting zone in the same area you identify as a public use zone, uh, you're creating a user conflict which uh, carries uh, a certain liability with that. Um, I had to address one at this refuge when I came here, and uh, that is a potential. Uh, in other words, you're saying come here and hunt, and you're saying come here and take a nature walk. Conflict 
Um, if you designate certain areas as hunting, provide a certain safety zone, you can provide uh, access for for uh, the public in, in in the form of a nature trail or uh, even in so much as a, a kiosk or an information board. Uh, there's different there's different ways of uh, handling. Uh, there's a there's a lot of interest in this particular parcel, and we have another half a dozen items that we need to uh, crank into the to the conservation easement, and um, it, it starts to make it difficult to to uh, juggle them. I think it's critical as we start to define these areas, as you call them, user conflict, that the, that the board, the council here, be involved in, because that's really some policy decisions that could be that could be having to be made, or at least that you could run the idea by us in terms of here's what I see as the safety zone, here is the recreational zone, here is the hunting zone. I'd like to be fully appraised and participate in that. I don't want to relinquish that right in terms of how much is the hunting zone versus the recreation and, and how good is that buffer zone, because I am very concerned of people's for people's safety if we encourage them to go use it recreationally. You know, I don't I don't want to be sitting in a very awkward position where someone was injured or killed down there. So I hope that part is not relinquished by the council as you as you continue to appraise the manager who will then appraise us of developments down there. That's not relinquished by the community. Because I think it's at the beginning of the actual language and easement that we we will go along with state and federal regulations or maybe close as a public safety or public hazard or, or as you will so we recognize that and you know it, as you brought this up I could see the same potential that you're, you're talking about mm -hmm. so it would be if we resolve all these things um, it would be the responsibility of the manager whoever they may be um, to identify the zones but that's later yeah. you, you can't really ad address that here yeah, no. I, mean, I just, I just, I know how seeds, when you plant them in fertile soil, will grow up and yeah. become big and trees. And, and I don't, don't want this to grow yeah. and become a problem while we're just at the, yeah. at the planting of the seed stage. Yeah, that's why we try to initially address the idea of if there is some sort of a hazard or, or a public unsafe, um, we will relinquish that right to the town. We will adhere to any state and federal regulation, just like the town has to adhere to state and federal regulation. Mm -hmm. I know it's a like a cover all but we all have to adhere to that but we did try to recognize that in, in our conversations with Mike um, I would like to just address your comment about the appraisal uh, we have no objection I mean seriously if you want to have an appraisal done fine I would say that an appraisal done to federal standards is different than an appraisal done out on the outside we have very strict rules that we have to adhere to um, when we do an appraisal. I can tell you, um, we're more than happy to give you a list of appraisals. I can't do this personally, I don't have the list with me, of people that know how to prepare a, an appraisal for federal standards. If you don't want to do that, hire somebody. I can tell you right now the chances are they're going to call us for comparable sales because we're the ones that buy Marsh. Just. I, might, I just want to be open and honest with you about that because we get calls from appraisers all the time. What are you paying for marshland? Uh, I, I've answered at least three or four that I can think of about what do you pay for a conservation easement. Okay. I answered his home. He's right. I answered his home phone today. Somebody called about comparables for marshland. So the appraisers know that we're the ones that are buying it, either us or the state. And in, in this area, we are the market. But I want, I just, I'm not saying don't, I'm just saying that's the, that's the reality. Okay. Well, in the interest of moving this along, um, Michael, uh, pending your discussion, further discussions on these items that have been brought up by members of the council, um, we should hold on posting for public hearing. I would think. I would think you would want to table this until you had a had a report on further negotiations. Do I hear a motion, Bill? I'll I'll make that a motion, and I would if I'm able, no. Madam Chairman, I, I would like to ask. Debate it. 
that uh, you're not going to let me do it. And I'll you can wait. ask I'll a table point. It after point I made my comment. Okay. 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 That's good. Better. <laughs> uh, I'm in I'm very much in agreement that uh, what Councilor Tory just brought up about if we're going to have a recreational area down there, that it will be separated and well signed and everything or it's either going to be a hunting area, one or the other. I don't think, maybe you can have both, but you people know more about it than I do, but I think it's pretty hard to have both. It's quite a few school children go down there in the springtime and they walk out through there, what have you, and I don't think you prohibit that, do you, regardless. So uh, if we're going to put trails and what have you in there, I just hope that we get it separated properly so nobody will get hurt, like he says. So I'll move it the table till later date. Is there a second? Second. Any? All those in favor? Anyway, you all made a mistake. Okay. It's unanimous. Thank you, Thank you. gentlemen. Thank you. And, and we will be having further discussions. I've got your number. <laughs> Sure. <coughs> <coughs> Item number. of the subdivision approval, the planning board uh, required Pond Cove Associates to uh, obtain a drainage easement uh, from the town for water that, ex that comes over into the catch basin on the town hall property. Uh, traditionally, there's been a kind of a loose relationship between uh, the property owners next door and the town hall property. We discovered a few years ago, for instance, that one of our buildings was in fact on their property. Uh, they, the property owner that was involved in, in that one, who, who was a member of the associates, although it wasn't specifically associates' property, very graciously uh, granted us an easement, uh, granted us a transfer of property uh, to make sure that our building was in fact in our lot. Uh, this is simply, you know, I think a, a good legal uh, practice in that if, if you do have drainage extending from one property to another, that uh, there be an agreement between the two parties uh, uh, in the form of an easement. So I would recommend uh, that you grant uh, this 20-foot drainage easement to Pond Cove Associates and authorize me to sign the document uh, executing uh, the easement. Uh, Councilor Council Lester Jordan. If somebody had been doing this for 100 years and never been stopped, don't they still don't they have the right to do it anyway, period? Perhaps this uh, just makes it so that we don't get into a contest uh, in later years. It, it just cleans up the, the fact that's, that's been around for a long time. I'll move that we uh, have the uh, town manager uh, enter into an agreement, give them the easement, 20 foot easement. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. Item number 82, to consider approving a dedication of land in accordance with section 16-3-10 in the pending runaway farm subdivision to the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust and take any necessary action. Michael? Uh, you have before you a map that shows uh, the lot in question. It's located over in the vicinity, uh, not too far from the Spurling Church, uh, specifically across the street, uh, sort of behind the, the old Layton property. There's a gravel pit in, in the area. I think you're all familiar with it. Again, this was a subdivision uh, that has been going through uh, the planning board. Uh, the developer is a gentleman by the name of Lawrence Eubank, who is here, who is here this evening. 
uh, Nat Clifford of the Land Trust is also here this evening. The subdivision regulations of the town require that any dedication of land as a result of a subdivision uh, go to the town council for approval regardless of what, whether or not the dedication go to uh, the town itself or to a group such as the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust. Uh, this has been extensively reviewed uh, by the planning board and they do recommend that you authorize the that you, the exact wording uh, according to the ordinance regulations is that you approve the dedication. Nat Clifford is here tonight. Did you have anything you wanted to contribute to that explanation, Nat? As I'm sure you're all aware, the um, conditions of approval by the planning board um, were that the area designated in lot number five on the uh, development plan of the subdivision plan is deeded to the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust and in turn that the town receive an easement from the land trust which uh, I believe is before you now. The ordinance requires that the town manager and town attorney approve the easement which uh, again has been submitted for that approval. Key to the easement are the words that appear on the first page. Um, again, this is the easement from the land trust, assuming our taking title to the property. Um, the words that the property is to remain in a substantially undeveloped, open, and natural state. Um, paraphrasing again, uh, it is the purpose of the grantor, being the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust, and the holder, the town of Cape Elizabeth, to assure the protection and conservation of the property and again, paraphrasing further down, the grantor and the holder have the common purpose of conserving the natural values of the property. All of this implies the use that the property is to be put to and also the cooperative relationship that we hope uh, exists and will continue to between the town and the land trust. Any questions of that? Uh, Councilor Jordan? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I just don't understand why we grant an easement, conservation easement, to the land trust, where I take it the town has its own conservation commission, and I thought that that's the purpose of the conservation commission was to have land turned over to the town of Cape Elizabeth and not to another entity for conservation purposes. Now, if somebody wants to come along and give the land to the land trust, that's okay. That's separate altogether in my opinion. But when they give it to the, they want to give it to the conservation, I mean the land trust and get credit for the ordinance about dedicating so much open space and then ask the town to transfer it over. I don't quite, I don't quite understand and I don't think that we should do that. <coughs> I think that land, if it's gonna be a conservation easement and to fit the ordinance should stay within the town of Cape Elizabeth and the town of Cape Elizabeth only as far as title and changes. So I am, I am opposed to uh, this item as far as changing, transferring it to land trust. I think that it's a conservation easement that should stay within the town. If I may respond through the chair. Yes. Um, Mr. Jordan alluded to the town giving up an easement or giving up uh, something. You further indicated that you have no objection to the land trust receiving um, deeds or easements. In this case, to clarify the situation, the land trust uh, has or will be deeded the property without restriction. And to conform to the language in the easement, which we believe is a proper use and restriction to place on land, we would like to have somebody hold an easement. 
over and above any language in any town ordinances, which I don't believe is appropriate for me to comment on, we are therefore giving to the town an easement. The town is giving up nothing in this case. And were the process to stop with our receipt of a deed for the property, in other words, ownership and fee simple for the 19 acres, we, in turn, I think, the land trust, would aggressively seek a recipient for the easement to assure us that the property would be maintained in the manner that we want it to be. We can't give ourselves that easement. And the deed, for various reasons, cannot be restricted. It has to be a, a free and clear transfer of the property without restriction. So as the property comes to the land trust without restriction, the next question is how can we be assured that that property will be covered by these types of restrictions? So that really this is, in one sense, outside the process that's indicated within the uh, uh, new section of the town uh, subdivision regulation. Now the fact that the town is being given the easement has satisfied the planning board uh, in administering the regulation of the, of the uh, subdivision uh, ordinance that uh, requires the 10% donation. Uh, Doug? Go ahead. I, go ahead. Oh, oh, are you? I had a question, but go ahead. Go ahead. You have the floor. Well, <clears throat> I, I understand what you're saying as far as <clears throat> it's already been uh, deeded to the land trust and then you come to the town for a conservation easement. Why, <clears throat> if there's going to have a conservation easement there, why doesn't the Conservation Commission recommend to the town council, which is part of a committee uh, of the town, for accepting that as a conservation easement in the name of the town of Cape Elizabeth? The chairman they can of do the, that. They me. can do that within the ordinance by giving the developer can do that within the ordinance, can he? The developer has no further rights on the property once he has extended or given the deed to the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust. His, his role at that point is, is over with. He has no further right or interest in the uh, 19 acres. Well, the, they, he didn't know what was going to happen when he uh, went to you people and uh, give the land to the land trust then. Then he realized afterwards that he had to, uh, to get, have the conservation easement, that for you people to have a conservation easement, then you had to come back to the town. I just, I just don't quite understand why we got to go through this. Uh, Michael. Yeah, perhaps, perhaps I could answer it uh, rather directly. Uh, by the property owner deeding it to the land trust free and clear, uh, any property owner in in a situation like this receives full credit on their taxes for a contribution. Uh, once you, full, based on a full value, once you begin to put, much as the discussion we just had with Rachel Carson, once you begin to put all sorts of restrictions on it, it reduces the value of the land uh, for for tax purposes for the original owner. Uh, one one advantage in this instance of having the land trust uh, and, and having a middleman involved is that there's more of an incentive to donate land uh, because someone can get the full tax benefit from it. And, you know, I think that's in some respects, uh, you know, why this arrangement is before you in this manner tonight and perhaps why other similar arrangements will, will be uh, before you in the future. If I For may tax purposes, just well. respond to that. This is a part I don't agree with. The town of Cape Elizabeth is losing the land, and it will then belong to another group, and uh, I don't think that is what we should be doing. And if there's something in the tax law that gives them a, a benefit to give it to the land trust, all the land in the future will be going to land trust instead of to the town. If it's going off the rolls, of the taxpayers of the town of Cape Elizabeth and then doesn't stay within the town and then goes to somebody else, somebody should be paying the taxes on it. I was speaking of federal taxes, income taxes, and it's the deduct deductibility of the contribution. Uh, Councilor Jordan. Uh, yeah, I, I've been in agreement of what the uh, land trust is 
trying to do it in the land and so forth. But with this particular instance where we've just passed a new ordinance that a developer has to either give 10% of his land or, or money, uh, I don't, I think this is a precedent setting. I, I, I don't see that they'd be given it to a entity. They should be given it to the town of Cape Elizabeth. So that's where I agree with Billy, perhaps. And I'd like to get in on it, really. I wish somebody would give me the land. And then I would, I could just say I was going to find it or something. I, I don't think it's right that, that a developer can give it to that 10% to anybody he wants to. That's my hang up on it. I have. Councilor Tinsman. I just had a couple of quick questions and I then I'd like a little longer answer on another question. But basically this is to meet the provisions of a new subdivision ordinance requiring the ten percent donation or whatever for open passive recreation land as part of the development. Is that what you're trying to say? No, my position, uh, Mr. Tinsman, is that um, the land trust would like to be assured that this land will be protected in an open state forever. In order to do that, the land needs to be encumbered either through deed restrictions or through an easement such as this. Now, for the reasons that uh, the manager alluded to, the owner, the current owner of this property, elected to donate the land free and clear to the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust um, in good faith that we would assure that the land was tied up uh, in perpetuity. The only way we can do that, since we can't give ourselves an easement, is to extend the easement or find another recipient for it, the town being a very logical recipient. That is one chain of events. It also so happens, and a chain of events that the land trust is not involved in, that the planning board elected to have that extension of an easement or the giving of an easement to the town satisfy the 10% requirement exactly conforming to the language in the uh, subdivision regulation. Okay, what is the nature of this land? Is it flat, flat hilly? It runs wet? from a marshy area down towards a brook that flows into the uh, um, um, Spurwink Marsh, uh, back to some upland uh, areas. The appraisal indicates that it was uh, considered as a single house lot, which I fully believe it uh, would have qualified as. So what it is basically is a 19-acre swamp on one end, highland on the other, uh, house lot. And I guess my last question, where does a land trust involve itself with the planning board process? In other words, do you negotiate, just because I'm unfamiliar mm. with your process, do you negotiate with the landowner prior to the planning board review on the process? Do you insert yourself within the review? Are you asked to by the planning board? Or is this an option? The planning board says, well, we can go to the Conservation Commission or uh, let's go to the land trust with this one. I mean, how, how do you involve yourself and how did it happen to come down this way? In this Other than the tax reasons, which yeah. I think could have been applied to the Conservation and yes, it could be. And then, in fact, as has happened in the past, the easements would flow in the opposite direction. Town would own, land trust would, would hold an easement. Um, either entity holding a parcel of property free and clear can do anything with it. And if, in fact, it's, it's generally agreed by whoever that the property should be maintained in perpetuity in a forever wild state, then one should own and the other should hold the easement. And it really as far as I can tell, and I think uh, most of my directors would agree with me, it doesn't make any difference which way the ownership and the easements flow. How we become involved with the, with the planning board, and you use words like negotiation, I don't believe we should be. And I believe the, the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust is a private, non-profit entity dedicated to preserving open space in Cape Elizabeth. In this case, we should be characterized as a uh, recipient for a piece of property that an owner wanted to see dedicated forever wild. And we followed the trust um, placed on us by the owner in extending this easement to the town. 
um, our charter and the activities of other land trusts that are older than ours, which is uh, only a couple of years old, and we're really feeling our way into some of these uh, um, ways of preserving land. But our charter will allow us to become more aggressive and to perhaps in the future form coalitions with developers in order to preserve open space on the basis that half a loaf is better than none. Um, at the moment, uh, we are not advocating any development project in the town, and again, should be characterized as recipients. Um, if it should come to pass that the land trust should become involved in a development project, again, because the parcel of land might be too rich for us to uh, take on by ourselves, it'll be patently clear to the planning board in the town exactly what our role is. And in this case, again, I want to emphasize that uh, we are simply a recipient that was contacted by a developer, or by a property owner, actually, um, to take on this 19 acres and guarantee him that it would be kept in a forever wild state. And there was some faith needed, and I think uh, the flexibility of a private entity such as the land trust and our ability to commit um, again, we have the same constituency as the town, but I think we're able to function in, in a more streamlined fashion. We don't have the burdens, obviously, that uh, town government does and a single purpose. And um, this, I think, is an example of a, of a property owner feeling this was the right way to go to assure that the land would be placed in a forever wild state. Uh, Councillor Carson, welcome aboard. Thank you. Um, I guess what I want to say, we've had some discussions about the relationship between the land trust, Cape Elizabeth Land Trust, and the town of Cape Elizabeth. But it seems in this particular uh, issue, item, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the ordinance that we set where it requires 10%, ask for 10% of the land or dollars uh, to be given, to dedicate it over to the town of Cape Elizabeth or any other approved entity. Isn't, isn't there some words in our ordinance that... Mm -hmm. should, there isn't any? It says, uh, or land, or such a entity of the land trust. Okay. Or such an or such as an entity of the land trust. Uh, so in, in, in this particular item, doesn't this meet actually the, the exact wording of the ordinance as we approved it? Even though we may have some other issues with the land trust in, in understanding the position of the two things, the town and the land trust, this particular item meets the letter of the the ordinance as we approved it, does it not? That's section, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. I, can, I just, can I just follow up on that in a second? Yes. Just for clarification purposes, it seems to me here that you, that the developer, if, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but the developer kind of approached the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust and said, here's something that I'd like to work out, and then together went to the planning board rather than the planning board recommended this to the developer saying you're going to have to give up this bunch of land and we recommend that you give it to the land trust because I think the essence of the questions is why would one town one one, one board of the town i.e. the planning board of the conservation commission recommend it be given to the Cape Elizabeth land trust rather than the town that that doesn't seem to make sense that it should do that rather than give it to the town if there's no tax advantages to giving it to the, to the land trust but in this case it seems that outside of the planning board process, is that is that correct? What happened? That is correct, and, and so I think that helps alleviate mm, some of the, the, the fears possible. Never, for the record, in any of my conversations with the owner of the property, uh, did the subject of the 10 percent requirement come up. Right. Um, the owner simply wanted to make a donation of the 19 acres, and uh, it later came in through activity with the planning board between the owner and the planning so board. We may worry about that down the road, but that. that Mm -hmm. pertinent to this particular example. Councilor Jordan. So I would answer uh, Councilor Carson's uh, dilemma over there. That's where I disagreed on pa passage of that ordinance on where it says that you could give it to the land trust. Uh, even though I dearly love the land trust and what they're doing, I just don't think it's right that you can satisfy this ordinance by giving it to a private entity. I, I think if they can give it to the land trust, he ought to be able to give it to me. Maybe he wouldn't want to because it, cause I couldn't give him a tax break, but maybe I could say I was going to build a church on the thing or something like that. Maybe he could get a tax break then. And I, I think it should be given. If you're going to satisfy the ordinance requirement that we 
that ordinance that was passed, I think it should be given to the town of Cape Elizabeth rather than a private entity. We would need to correct that. Uh, yes. Uh, Nat, uh, how does the public gain access to this um, property, which looks to be kind of landlocked? Is it this little strip here, the public yes, waiver? Yes, that's a 10-foot strip that runs from Square Week Avenue into the 19-acre parcel, and that also will be needed to the to the land trust, so it's part of the 19 acres. It is. Yeah. The reason for holding to a 10-foot width is to prevent parking in that area that, uh, um, again, the... It will be a trail. It won't be that's a, road, correct. a dirt road. No. That's correct. Councilor Amaro? Uh, Mr. Clifford, what happens uh, to any property that the land trust accumulates over the years if the land trust at some point is dissolved? Our charter, and it's typical of most organizations, land trusts in the state and, and other conservation organizations, our charter requires that all our holdings, easements and uh, ownership and fee simple be transferred to a similar organization. And that could be another land trust, uh, even though it may be another town, it could be the Nature Conservancy, it could be the Maine Coast Heritage Trust. There are plenty of organizations around that would uh, take on the um, ownerships and easements. In, in your uh, charter, uh, do you have the ability to sell off parcels of this land in order to purchase another piece of land that you might find more desirable at some point? Yes, we do. And that is one of the reasons um, that land trusts are able to function effectively, but also one of the reasons that we wanted to place an easement on this property to uphold our agreement um, with the owner. In other words, restrictions could not be put in the deed, but the owner wanted to see the property preserved. And the most effective way to do it is to place easements on the property, because I can't guarantee that some future board of directors uh, years down the road might not sell the property. And in fact, that might possibly be the concern that potential donors would have in deeding property to the, to the town. Uh, again, we have a single purpose. The town uh, has many consideration. But the town could also put the same sort of uh, uh, requirement. That's correct. On any piece of land that was donated. That's right. And that, in fact, has happened with the Stonegate uh, dedication of land to the town, is that we did put very uh, stringent restrictions on that piece of property. Oh, Frank. Just to follow up on that, could it have been in the charter that the land would revert back to the town if the if upon the dissolution of the un, you know the unfortunate dissolution of the Cape Elizabeth mm -hmm. Land Trust? I know that may be floating through seven people's minds that are up here right now. Yeah. Um, if the land trust is negotiating in good faith, either for donation or purchase of of properties um, or easements, uh, on the basis that those properties are to be maintained in a forever wild state. Um, and with various types of restrictions on them. Um, the town, again, is, is uh, an organization not dedicated to the preservation of open space. Uh, there are many, many considerations, budgetary uh, constraints. Uh, and in order to maintain the same type of ownership, the properties would have to revert to a similar organization. And this is very standard in, in any conservation organizations. Uh, charter. And in, this comes up uh, almost 100% uh, uh, of the time when we're talking with uh, property owners about either purchasing or they're donating property to us, the question of what happens if we do go out of business. And the answer being uh, the property would revert to a similar organization satisfies that, uh, that question. Uh, Penny? Do most uh, people who give land to the land trust put the same restrictions on that it shall re forever remain as open space? Because if they do not put those restrictions on, then those are the pieces that the land trust could sell. But if an owner always puts the restrictions on that he wants it to remain as an open space or it should be used as recreation, or whatever he stipulates, mm. then, no, then you can't sell it. Or even when you give it to somebody else, that restriction will pass on. Is that correct? That's correct. Well, you know, I mean, to be honest with you, I think that our discussions have been that that we, 
you know, I would say to myself, I would prefer to have this town, if, you, if this organization should dissolve, I would prefer to have this land revert to the town with those same stipulations that it remain as open space than to some other created entity. And I would hope that if the restrictions were written in there, the easements, that we would also, I mean, you'd have to respect those. Mm -hmm. But to have these pieces of land be floating around with the possible dissolution of a variety of organizations with no control of the town of Cape Elizabeth means that without restrictions by the owner, they could be bought and sold and bought and sold and bought and sold. So that the owner's original intent, if not made clear, his original intent, he may think he's giving it to the town of Cape Elizabeth to remain ever open, but if he doesn't stipulate that, then that land is up for grab 10, 10 years from now to be traded as for another piece. So we are very concerned that that, that the owner understand absolutely completely that he's giving it to the land trust and that that is not the same as giving it to the town of Cape Elizabeth. And that if he puts no restrictions on it, then the land trust can do a variety of things with it in the future couple of decades, let's say. So I, I would have to, I don't know how the land trust works, but I would certainly hope that he knows those things. First of all, he's given it to the land trust, not to the town of Cape Elizabeth and that you do have the right to sell or trade or swap or something down the road. And if he wants it to remain forever open, then he needs to go through an easement process such as this. Or needs to agree that an easement will be placed on the land, but it cannot be documented in the transfer if a full tax deduction is to be maintained. Again, that's, that's a matter of, of faith that, that uh, the donor has to hold his breath for just that second that the land transfers to the land trust and then the easement transfers to the town in this case. But how about the other cases? You might may, you may be holding land now that you could sell five years from now, but that was not really the intent of the owner when he gave it to you. Thinking very quickly about the ownerships that we have, uh, the owner's wishes are covered in one way or another. And again, the flexibility that the land trust has, uh, I, I believe also as a fledgling organization, it'd be uh, suicide for us to, to uh, leave even doubt in, a, in an owner's land and, uh, or in his mind as to what would happen to the land. Um, for the record, and this is a little bit off the record, uh, um, I have sensed and, and we've had discussions uh, with, with various uh, segments of the council um, I see a greater communality of interest than, than I believe uh, all of you uh, maybe in certain senses are expressing. And I, I would welcome a workshop session. Um, I would suggest that I should bring others from my board of directors that, uh, uh, so you can have the basis of a, of a consensus rather than just one fool's opinion. But uh, I think it would be extremely productive because I, I, many of the concerns you have I know are covered. And we could go through our ownerships and through some of our goals and, and uh, things that we hope to accomplish in town. And I, I think what you say about uh, how do we treat land given us, I think there are parcels of land that the town owns that uh, uh, we and other citizens might be concerned about. And I think there may be a process of, of uh, um, easementing some of those to, to protect both ways. And uh, the town, I think, has to maintain uh, uh, free ownership of certain parcels of land, uh, uh, the land the town hall sits on, obviously. But uh, um, I, I think, again, there's that communality of interest that, that uh, I, a workshop would be tremendously productive, and I'd uh, welcome it. We, we, we do intend to do that. And actually, this is, I think we should bring the subject of this discussion back to the item mm. on the agenda. But these were questions that we were sort of getting into that we had asked at other workshop sessions. And we sure do want a workshop because we don't understand exactly how it works. But I'd like to bring it back if I can to the item on the agenda. Councilor Jordan. I just want to <clears throat> just want to say that I had understood from a member of Land Trust, but I guess I didn't put the question to him right, that if Land Trust went defunct, uh, that it would revert to the town of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, the holdings. Now I understand you could uh, transfer your land to uh, Maine Coastal, any of these, uh, you might say, land trust type entities, maybe up from North Overshoe, as far as we're concerned. If you're, I'll admit, what you people are doing, I'm sitting here thinking of what might happen in years to come. You're, you might not be there. 
because you were one of the originals intent and other people get different ideas as, as time goes on and this is a part that disturbs me and mm -hmm. it disturbs me very deeply that we're losing this land by not being in the town of Cape Elizabeth and even though that as long as you're here and, and your group is available other people might think different 10, 15 years from now and uh, I would hope that and I've mentioned to you before about a workshop, and I'd hope that we could have one, have one fairly soon, because I am going to recommend that, even though I'm a member of it, the ordinance committee, take a hard look at that portion of the ordinance, and I think the land trust deal should be stricken from it, and I would propose that at a later date. Now, I just have two quick questions. Did you work with the Conservation Commission Yes, the chairman of the Conservation Commission reviewed this uh, uh, easement before it went to the town, and his comments are incorporated uh, in here. Okay. Um, and uh, does this have any relation to the proposed Green Belt plan? Is it anywhere near, I know it's near the Spurwink Mark. Mm. Um, is it? It does it, not. Is it, it's not near related to Great Pond. No. No. It's sort of off on its own. For the moment it is, yes. It could be a partial leg. Getting out from the old Cooper property mm -hmm. to Fowler Road to Sprague Easement. We're not far from the axis of the green belt that would go through uh, the area in back of the town uh, transfer station. And, you mean uh, Gullcrest? Yeah. That's right. It's not far. That's correct. It's possible that they could be. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, Councilor Tinsman. Just one question when it comes to retaining rights of the land trust as opposed to the easement restrictions on the town. I notice that you're retaining a lot of rights as deeded owners, title holders. And those rights could be interpreted, in my mind, to be public rights or public needs at some point in time. And for instance, if we needed an easement for sewerage, water, electrical, or whatever, in behalf of the town, you uh, retain those rights. How do we work with the land trust in obtaining further rights in this land that you have? For instance, the landowners on Fowler Road develop some real problems and need additional land for sewerage or for the septic system. That's specifically excluded in our agreement. We cannot, we cannot allow that to happen. We have not allowed us to let that happen on this land. Now, he gave it with no restrictions, and now you're putting restrictions as part of your conservation easement. How do we work those out later? I'm not an attorney, but uh, my interpretation of this would be that the land trust would be no different than any other property owner. We have extended the town an easement, giving the town certain rights to that land. One of those rights is not running a sewer across the land. However, the easement does not preclude the sale or an additional easement to permit that sewer to go across the land. There, there uh, is no lessening of, of that capability. It simply is not part of this bunch of rights that we're extending to the town. So you could, in fact, transfer the land, the ownership interest and in the land behind those homes to the individual homeowners subject to our conservation easement, if you needed some cash. I don't see that the easement would have any effect. I think you would go back to a, to a parcel of land that, that uh, is owned by the land trust. The town has certain rights. Placing a sewer there is not one of those rights. Therefore, you'd have to go through the process of a new easement or purchasing a land in fee simple or taking it by eminent domain. Okay, but as far as the landowners go, and this is just a, a, a wild scenario that mm. may not happen, but those landowners on Fowler Road could purchase the land from the land trust subject to the conservation easement that the town has. And in essence, they would be retaining the rights that you have or propose to have. You could sell pieces of this land to a third party those third parties with the with the easement sure subject to the conservation easement. right <coughs> that would be the process to go yeah. through well 
we, we talked earlier about the land trust uh, going out of business, and if the ownership should transfer to another entity, uh, the condition would still be the same. In other words, you would be dealing with a different entity, but, but again, um, probably eminent domain would be the ultimate if, if negotiations couldn't uh, achieve uh, a right away. The only reason I even brought this up mm. was that there's a mechanism where private ownership can be obtained from the town if necessary. I mean, if there's a need for subsurface septic systems, it can be done through mm -hmm. the town because we sit up here and we could allow that to happen. Where the land trust owns it, we've removed ourselves from that negotiating posture. It's not the intent. That's correct. It's not the intent of this easement to transfer that right to the town. I don't know whether that makes the council feel uncomfortable or not. But. Councilor Carson. I think I'd like to move this question, and I think that I would also encourage, I'm not going to make it a motion, but that we get into a workshop so that we all understand the position of the town and the land trust. I'd like to move the question of item, num item number 82, uh, and approve the dedication of land in accordance with section 16-3-1-0 and in the pending runaway farm subdivision to the Cape of Land Trust. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? Councilor Amaral? You know, I'm really very uncomfortable about this whole procedure and uh, I would agree with Councilor William Jordan, that uh, I'd like to take another look at section 16-3-10 uh, also, uh, because I really have the feeling that if the town has no real control over this land that's being dedicated, uh, that we ought to, ought to reconsider what we did in establishing that ordinance, uh, because our I feel was to provide for the town uh, open space areas for recreation that the town did in fact have control over. Uh, so I, I'm going to vote for this tonight because it does comply with our ordinances, but I feel very uncomfortable doing so. We ready for a vote? Councilor Latore? I, I would just like to say I understand Councilor Amro's concern, but I do need to put in a, a certain plug, I guess, for the word that Nat used earlier, which is faith. And we certainly have worked with the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust. We've seen it grow and evolve, and there has to be some type of a rapport between the town and this land trust in order to make this thing work. And the only other rapport that I'm really familiar with is in the town of Freeport, where the land trust and the municipal land bank, people are working together and making it work. And I don't want to come across as at all pessimistic towards it. I'm very optimistic towards this organization. And this is, there are certain leaps of faith that are going to have to be met, which we can work out in workshops, et cetera. But I don't have any rethinking in my own mind whatsoever of that ordinance. I knew exactly what I was voting for when I drafted it and voted for it. You know, I was voting for the, the faith that I have in the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust to accomplish that we have one set of goals that we're working on together. And they can provide certain tax advantages that we as a municipality can't. But as far as I'm concerned, our goals towards providing open space are totally harmonious and one. So I, I, I wanted to just state that from my opinion on this whole situation. Councilor Jordan? Just, just one comment that, uh, comment that uh, Nat made that kind of disturbed me that uh, didn't feel the council was very, I forgot just a word you used there, as far as obtaining land for open space due to budget restraints and what have you. I'll admit we haven't put any bucks into it, but I think the town of Cape Elizabeth has picked up quite a little land through agreements with developers in the last few years, and I think we've made a big step forward. And I think the problem that bothers me here, that you can take your land and do what you want to, but we have to answer to the taxpayers. And I'm sure if we went to sell a parcel of it, there'd be some taxpayers here and it might end up in a, something like a referendum or something like that. So I think we are working in that direction. I, I just want to say, Michael, before you have your two cents worth that, uh, I feel that uh, the town and, and the, the 
land trust are working toward the same goal, and that is the preservation of open space and uh, public enjoyment of that. And um, I would welcome a workshop to learn more about your organization. I would welcome um, trying to get you to rethink the ability of, of land reverting to the town. But I do not have any problems with voting for this, for approving it at this time. I just had a question for Mrs. Carson clarifying the motion. You, you asked that the dedication of land be approved. I didn't hear the, the portion of accepting the easement. You just was asked if you intended to include that in the motion. Yes. And we had a second. Yes. Are you ready for the vote? All those in favor? One, two, three, four. Opposed? Four to three. Passed. Um, at, at this uh, juncture, we'll take a five minute break. If uh, the councillors will take their seats, we will get resume with item number 83 to consider a request from Edward Millett for a sewer extension. Michael. Yeah, this gentleman has submitted a letter to the town requesting an extension of the sewer on Angel Terrace. It would serve uh, just one home uh, that is yet to be built uh, on Angel Terrace. Uh, I would suggest that you refer this to the Board of Sewer Appeals. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. Item number 84, to consider a report from the Board of Sewer Appeals regarding a sewer extension request from Theodore Wainwright and take any necessary action. Mike. We received a call at 4.30 this afternoon from Mr. Leslie Lowry, who is the attorney for Mr. Wainwright, asking that this item be tabled. Is there a second? second? All those in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. I'm abstaining. Do we have a consensus from the council that Councilor yeah, William that. Jordan may abstain? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, six, four, one abstaining. Item number 85, to consider a progress report from the town manager on the Sawyer Road reconstruction project and take any necessary action. Michael. Thank you. I put this on the agenda because, because it is such a significant project and one is essentially one to give the council to answer questions or to provide any feedback to me if you've heard from, from any citizens. Uh, the, as things now stand, the final design is just about completed. Uh, there have been meetings held uh, with uh, some of the property owners involved. Uh, the appraisal process has begun. Uh, within the next month, uh, there, there's going to be an extensive amount of work spent, of time spent by myself, as well as by the engineers and the appraiser, at trying to finalize uh, many of the details of the project. Uh, thus far, uh, from the meetings, there have been some suggestions uh, from the abutters, some of which we have been able to address uh, in a very positive way. Uh, someone wanted a willow tree removed we've agreed that we'll, we'll remove that willow tree, uh, that the roots will be very close to the road. There was another party that, that is concerned about how long the driveway will be uh, when the project is done. We've agreed that we'll widen the driveway to a double width so two vehicles can get in. We're, we're working in that spirit of, of trying to work with people, trying to resolve some of their problems. Uh, 
however, there, there have been some situations where the residents have recommended we shift the road. And what, what we found in, in one instance was if we shifted it, more trees would be lost. It would affect some people more adversely. And we, we really looked at it a long time and decided we just couldn't do that. And we have been communicating that back to the residents. But uh, it, it is rapidly approaching. Uh, the, in the next two months, probably more likely in July, uh, but perhaps in June, you will have before you uh, proposals for the acquisition of property as well as uh, beginning the bid process uh, for the project. Michael, do you, uh, when do you foresee the completion of this, before the snow flies? My sense is if there's not an absolute guarantee, and I, I mean absolute guarantee, underlined six times, that the road will be paved, at least with the base uh, level of pavement, uh, that will you know, we'll get it done this fall. Uh, we, we might divide it in, into two sections uh, to ensure that, but no matter what, we, you know, if we can't make that guarantee, we might delay the whole project to spring because it, it would be uh, terrible to leave that road open over the winter. Uh, Michael, how are we looking on the original budget projections and, and present budget? Uh, how much savings have you been able to garner through your excellent uh, means? None yet. Uh, <laughs> I met with the engineers last week and asked them to do a revised cost estimate. Uh, there, there have been a few little savings here and there, uh, one of which is up at the ex portion of Sawyer Road extending towards South Portland, that little bit that branches off. We pulled that back a little bit closer to the intersection because we found it was a huge piece of ledge that we'd have to remove. Uh, so there should be some savings there. Uh, but over, originally, over the, although it's too originally early to it say. was, what was the, what was it, 1.2 million was it, or 1.1? It, it was in that, I don't remember exactly off the top of my head, but that's, it definitely is in that range. So we're not going over, and yet any savings couldn't be considered significant in terms of the underside? Now, it's too early to say at this point, uh, you know, we, I've got to wait for the engineers to do the revised cost estimate. Nothing has happened that persuades me that the cost has changed dramatically one way or the other. Uh, w one other thing we're discussing, we haven't come to a conclusion, is perhaps writing into the specifications that we would allow Pickett Street to be closed off uh, during the construction since there currently are no residents there, or they may be soon, and that would enable them to get that section done that much quicker and, and really uh, get through there. There'd, there'd be some interruption from that, but. Uh, we're still looking at, at that possibility. There might be some dollar savings as a result of the, the speed within which the contractor could get through that area. <coughs> uh, so that's, you know, if anyone hears from residents concerns, I'd appreciate you relating them to me. And we, we hope to address all the concerns, but I, I know we won't be able to totally satisfy everyone. There is not any action necessary on your report. No, except to answer Bill's last question. Uh, just to accept his oral report. I would just want to say is what you just said a minute ago as far as making sure that it's going to be done and paid by this fall. And if you don't feel you can get it done, all done, you'll do a section of it and leave the other section until next year, next spring. Did I understand that correctly? That's right. Okay, how are you going to get a guarantee out of anybody to do that due to weather conditions or whatever? I, I, I think what I, what I was intimating was that unless they give me that guarantee, uh, unless they're willing to do it, the, the project won't go forward. I, I think it's a good idea, and I would like to take a hard look at closing Pickett Street because there is a lot of traffic there. Well, I'll admit there's no homes there, but there's quite a lot of traffic goes through there now. But if you could get a good saving out of have it closing it off for a week or two or three, I think it, maybe it could be worked out. But if all possible, it should be opened on weekends anyway. 
Counsel Torrey. Just a small technical point. If in the future when you have the summary of recommendations, if you just tell us what the oral report might be in reference to. I had a momentary heart flutter thinking you might come in saying you wanted a four-lane highway. But just some further explanation would be helpful. Okay. I should have explained that there was nothing alarming going on. Right. You know, regarding what, and then we can know a little better. Thanks. Quite well taken. So I'll move we accept the report. Is there a second? All those in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. Item number 86, to consider a proposed green belt plan and take any necessary action. This, for our audience at home, is the green belt plan. Move that we extend the green belt. Acknowledge receipt of the plan and send it to the planning board. Second? Second. Any discussion? Counselor Jordan. Yeah, by skimming through this, I see at least a couple of maps that, to me, are very inaccurate. Especially around the Great Pound area, map two, where it says large parcels under single ownership. Which I seem to be pretty familiar with the Spray Corporation land. And I'm also familiar with other landowners along there. And that shaded area that's showing Spray Corporation land, it just isn't showing a true picture. And a lot of people, the Sprays have given a conservation easement there, pedestrian easement along through there. And a lot of people follow the trail thinking they're on that easement when they actually aren't. They're on other people's land. And these other landowners aren't too happy about people trotting across there with mini bikes and dirt bikes and all that. I wish we could somehow get the maps to look more accurate. It shows that the Sprays have got a lot more land than they actually have. The same thing sort of holds true with the next map beyond that. With the acquired easements and land showing again that pedestrian easement that the Sprays gave. But it really isn't, looking at this map, it isn't really the land, the proper location of the land that was given. That's what I'm trying to say, I guess. And it makes it so misleading. And the general public thinks that there's a great easement across there when there really isn't. Do we have a motion? Yes. Okay. Counselor Amaro. I just wondered if Counselor Jordan has other maps that show more accurately, or if the Spray Corporation does, that shows more accurately what those easements actually cover. Because I don't think we should perpetuate an incorrect map into our new study, our new report. We should try to have the maps as accurate as possible. Can we take that up with the planning board? Could you provide some information, or at least discuss that with them? Certainly. When they discuss it. Michael, would you consider this to be a draft? It doesn't say draft. It's not really a draft, but that leads to a point I wanted to make. This is the preliminary copy. The copies that are here on the podium are the only seven copies in existence. They are being printed now, won't be available for about another 